Podcast City Network. The Everett Lee Show. Welcome to another episode of the Everett Lee Show. I'm the Everett Lee. Today on the program, back for his fifth or sixth appearance. He's pretty much tied with Todd Stretch, the horror nerd, right now for the most appearances on the Everett Lee Show. He's probably got him beat by one, and this would be the one right here today on the program. None other than the true master of wrestling ring music, Hurricane J.J. McGuire. I called him up recently and asked him if he'd love to come back on and just shoot the breeze. He said yes. He's always down for it, talking with Everett Lee, just everything from his early career with the Gentries to his book to wrestling entrance music and his current thought on the current state of independent wrestling. We even talk about one of the promotions that started back up here in Florida, CFWE. Give his thoughts and opinions on that. And at the time this was taken, the second show for CFWE hasn't started yet. You'll hear how hyped up he was about them doing their second show in February. Before we get on to that interview, I do want to mention that you can pick up Everett Lee Show merchandise over on podcastcity.net in the shop section. Be sure to pick yourself up a hat, t-shirt, anything with Everett Lee on it. And be sure to pick up and follow the other amazing podcasts on Podcast City Network. They have merchandise over there in the shop section. Be sure to pick you up some merchandise from them as well. Let's get on to the true master of wrestling ring music, Hurricane J.J. McGuire. The true master of wrestling ring music, Hurricane J.J. McGuire. (laughs) Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> you doing the thumb trick? <laughs> yeah, I do a little <laughs> thumb trick. They can't see it, but there it is. There it was. <laughs> I do that trick with my daughter, actually. And <laughs> the first time I did that, she was trying to grab my thumb and try to pull it off. She said, I want your yeah. thumb, Daddy. I said, I can't give it to you. It's attached. Only I can remove it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so this this is just a little bit different. Just about the same thing like we normally would talk, though. But we're on video chat right now on Facebook Messenger where we can actually see each other and have a conversation instead of over the phone. <laughs> and you, you can actually see me picking my nose if I need to. <laughs> yeah, you look good. You got some sun on you, it looks like. You've been out in the sun a little bit. Yeah, I I have. I have here lately. I've been out in the sun. I've been been in and out of the sun here in the last few months. You, uh, your goatee's a little bit white there. <laughs> your hair's grown out a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been riding my motorbike today, so it's all kind of messed up. But uh, life's good. That's amazing. That is amazing. I did see that picture you sent me of you and your motorbike. How's the weather's yeah. been good for that, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Today it's uh, like sixty-two degrees, so uh, flailed up over the mountain over here just to. I had to put a little extra air in the front tire, and I looked down. I was doing about seventy-two miles an hour. I thought, oh, who better roll it back? A lot of the get pulled over. <laughs> Living dangerously there, aren't you? I guess so. Uh, but it's a nice maxi scooter. It's a uh, Honda Helix or Helix, depending on what part of the country you're from. And it's a 250 cc vertical engine, but it'll do like 75, uh, 80 mile an hour on a flats. You know, it'll it'll jump out there. But it looks like something out of Buck Rogers, as you notice. Oh yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. I think that's neat. That's that's neat. That you're able to get out there and do something like that during these times. Get out there and just ride, enjoy the wind and your hair, and just go. I went to Kroger and um, as I was pulling in, I parked right up front. You know, on one of the spots underneath the the lights that are out in the parking lot there in the front door. 
And uh, as I had my back turned, I heard this voice, this older woman said, excuse me, sir. And I turned around, and as I was taking my helmet off and everything, that this little boy was with her holding her hand, and she said, he wanted to come over and say hi to you. And I said, hey, buddy, how are you? I, I guess he thought I was some kind of superhero or something coming in on that thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's a cute little boy. He probably wasn't more than four years old, probably. Right, right. My but daughter. Anyway, yeah. It's, but I managed to get uh, four complete bags of groceries in uh, my big duffel bag and then uh, strapped it to the back of it. Uh, they, it has handles back there where the passenger can hold on, you know. Right, and so I was able to wrap my bungee cords around that and hook them up, and yes, sir. So uh, it's my grocery getter, yes, sir. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, you you get the groceries on there, and you just it, that's it looks like you're having fun. That picture you sent me, and and I know yeah. the last couple times I talked to you, you said, yeah, I've been out on the motor scooter, just you know, having having some fun, just. You know, riding around and just enjoying myself, which is great. I'm I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. I, I definitely am. I'm glad you're getting to get to do that there. The uh, weather it's been kind of cold down here some nights and some night and just this past couple days it jumped up in the 70s and it was down in the 40s. When it gets in the 40s down here in the 50s, people act like it's a cold front coming in. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They act like it's like living up in Ohio, New York, up in there in those areas where where the weather when it gets cold it gets cold. But they act like the same thing here. And I think it's just because a lot of people that live up north from New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they all come down here. They all come down here to get away from that. And when it gets cold like that, kinda like here, they they freak out about it. <laughs> and then they happen to mention oh, i moved away from up there to get away from it down here it's like what do you expect it's winter the winter the the earth is rotating away from the sun <laughs> yeah it was down to 24 degrees up here night before last uh, it was in the upper 20s uh now today it was up around 62 tonight it's going to be a high 30s but then i think tomorrow when that front's coming through it's going to drop back down cold again, like 20-something at night. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's like 76 right now. I'm pulling it up right here on my on my phone. Yeah, tomorrow's Perfect scooter. Yep. Perfect scooter weather, baby. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> I wish I was there. Yeah, yeah. It's tomorrow's 79, high, low 50 tomorrow, partly cloudy. So that's, that's not bad. It's typical weather here for January. Well, at least it wasn't like it was couple years ago when you were down here in January that was freezing man was it not there when we had the one year anniversary of podcast City network that was freezing yeah that was that was cold that was cold I could barely play uh it was so cold that my hands were almost frozen mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it kind of rough it it was rough it was rough I checked out a wrestling show back last week or a couple weeks ago. Over in Polk County, CFWE ran its first show since in the last last time they ran a show. I believe it was like ten years ago, and they had their first show back. I was in attendance for that, and it was cold that night too. It was it was freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, weather change and a lot of other things kind of still the, still the same here for going into twenty twenty one, but. How, how's your 2021 been so far starting out? Well, uh, I got so put out with all the political rhetoric and screaming and carrying on, I just finally turned it all off and got back to a normal lifestyle. And uh, But I've, it's given me a chance to work on a lot of new music, and uh, I've been watching a lot of new wrestling organizations. That CFWE, that bunch, uh, they've got a good a bunch down there. Uh, I saw one of the, the first show that they happened to tape, and I was real impressed. Uh, for a first show, I, I figured that was the third or fourth show at least or beyond, but come to find out the CFWE, uh, that was their first show, and uh, uh, fantastic talent, and uh, the Black Death especially, uh, 
really impressive, and all the wrestlers were impressive. Uh, they've got a really great lineup. Uh, you're going to see a big boost in uh, regional and that sort of wrestling. You know, independent wrestling is going to really take off bigger than ever, I predict, um, because, you know, when you've just got one main wrestling faction or two, which you have, maybe three, you might include Ring of Honor in there too or whatever. You know, of course, you have WWE, you have AEW, and then you've got, uh, uh, you know, Ring of Honor and whatever, and they're all excellent organizations and everything. But you're going to see a big boom and big boost in, uh, you know, regional wrestling and independent wrestling and, there's, you know, really, uh, I saw a lot more action and continual activity in that CFWE show than I see in a lot of the big broadcast uh, shows, you know. Of course, they got a lot more time they got to fill and they got to drag around here and there and stretch it out and do goofy stuff. But, you know, that independent show that I saw CFWE do, I didn't see anything goofy anywhere. I mean, right. I thought the timing was that excellent. Uh Everything was really uh, spot on, I thought, and um, you know, and if that's if, if they're just starting right there and they're at that level on one show out of the box, and I'd keep my eyes on them pretty close, I believe, because they've got something. And uh, I've been contacted by a couple of their representatives, uh, perhaps to come down maybe later in the year, you know, when the virus uh, the vaccines kick in and less chance of stuff and. Uh, I take a medicine that uh, tells me I can't take any live vaccines or other vaccines while I'm taking this one particular medicine um, for my skin. I have a skin con minor skin condition or whatever, but um, I can't take I can't take the uh, the virus shot. You know, I can't take the uh, COVID shot, so I have to be real careful. So I told the CFWE representatives that. Uh, uh, yes, I, I definitely want to come, and uh, but it's going to need to be somewhere more towards the summer or something, right? Uh, to try to g give this virus thing uh, time to slack up some, you know, for my own safety and other people's as well. But I noticed that uh, quite a few of the people at the CFWE show did have masks on. Uh, some didn't, but it looked like they were in their own group. In other words, there's three or four people. They, you know, they had them together, uh, and then they had spaces and. So they're they're paying attention to uh, certain rules uh, for the safety of the patrons and each other and so on. So, so I'm hoping to come down and do some some stuff down there, maybe uh, uh, with them, uh, perhaps uh, later in towards the summer sometime. Hopefully, uh, maybe you'll be there too. I'll see you somewhere. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, I love live wrestling, independent wrestling. And if there's a ring, if you put a ring up, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll be there. It's like fill the dreams, build it, and they will come. And that's right. It was it was neat, actually being in a body shop with a ring in there. That's I've never never been in an environment like that. That that is like hardcore old school. We put a ring up. Here's where the ring's at, and. You come and you get to see some live wrestling, and it's just different atmosphere. I thought that was pretty neat. There, <laughs> I thought it was pretty. Yeah, neat. yeah, I did. I did too. And and uh, I noticed uh, they had it fixed up to where a, a lot of the people were actually sitting outside uh, in front of the big giant bay door that opens up. You know, you can drive two or three vehicles side to side through that door. And I noticed that there they uh, had quite a few people there, and they were seating people even outside there looking in. They still had an excellent view of everything. But I noticed that there were some chairs out in, outside in in the, in the opening of the uh, venue there. But um, no, I thought that was cool. Uh, plus, uh, if you don't like uh, another wrestler that well, you can drag them over there and beat their heads on the, the hoods of the cars and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could. You now could. I don't want to give any ideas. I don't want to give anybody any ideas. There. <laughs> 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 that would be something. Um, excuse me. That'd be something. That they'll, they'll probably do that at the next event. I think the next. They probably will. <laughs> I think the <laughs> next CFW event will be in February. So by the time this this comes out, 
the event will probably already happen or about to happen. It's. I know out. the name of that event too. I was, the representatives told me the name of that event. Do you know the name of the event? Bloody Valentine. That's it. <laughs> My bloody Valentine. What a perfect number. I said, yeah, sounds great. I really wish I could be a part of that that show, but I just need to wait a while, you know, for the virus to slack a little bit. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm just. When beginning in 2021 here, I'm just looking and just hoping that the rest of the year would just be better than last year. I know a lot of people are waiting for 2020 to end, and a lot of people figured at the beginning of 2021, everything will just magically just go back to normal. Now nah, it's going to take some time, man. This is going to take some time, and with everyone doing what, they're, what they need to do, it, it, it will help speed up the process and just eventually it it's going to take time to squash this it is it's it's yeah. going to take time to squash it and i just I, f I feel bad for the people that can't actually go out to sporting events enjoy that live wrestling and concerts no one can really do that but Last year, ACDC, when they, in November, when they put out their new album, Power Up, they went on a tour, and they they did good. <laughs> they, good they, yeah. they did good. Yeah. And the album, I think, was like number one, and that just shows you right there. I don't know if you heard the new ACDC. Their music hasn't changed in the last 40 years, man. <laughs> well, it's like ZZ Top, too. You know, they, they uh, except for the Eliminator album, People kept saying, well, they, they can't do a keyboard album. Buddy, they did. Listen to Eliminator. About every song on there was a hit, Sharp Dress Man, all that stuff. And, you know, uh, they just showed everybody, yeah, we can throw some keyboard on there and do that too. And they did it great. Mm -hmm. But they, but overall, they stayed with their same basic motif. You know, and Tom Petty was that way. Uh, you remember Joe Cocker? Uh, he, he never got, you know, he never went punk or some other avenue, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, don't get me wrong. I played in one of the first punk bands in Hollywood. Uh, we signed with uh, Joe Godfrey at Sound, the iconic Sound City Studios. And, uh, you know, uh, punk and new wave were the whole new, and, uh, you know, REM uh, type music, you know, alternative. Those three things there were the new big thing, you know, like in the 80s, early right. 80s. Right. And uh, mid 80s. And, uh, but uh, so uh, I didn't want anybody to misunderstand me because I was in one of the first punk bands that ever was, and we were called The Rage, and um, we were recording at the same time that Tom Petty was uh, working on one of his albums at Sound City, and so I got to meet him, and I got to meet also uh, working class dog, Rick Springfield, he was working on that album, um, uh, The Babies, uh, they were uh, there, everybody was there, it's anybody. And I was real lucky uh, that we were there at the same time recording our stuff, and I got to meet uh, a lot of those icons, you know, and hang out with them and have a lot of fun. But, um, yeah, the back to what we were saying, uh, the, the biggest groups ever were, uh, like ZZ Top and who we mentioned, they, they and Tom Petty and them, they stayed with their same kind of a motif through their whole career, and it just got bigger and bigger. Right. Right, right. If it's not broke, don't uh, don't try to fix it, and stick to that same yeah. formula. Stick to that same formula. I was watching. Me and my wife was watching a documentary on Michael Jackson, and when he got with Quincy Jones right before he broke out on his own from the Jackson Five, Quincy showed him a a way in the studio that a formula that he used, Michael used out through his music career, and it never failed him because he had hit after hit. And they were having trouble there on the uh, the one song that uh, on his first album that uh, he performed where they had to go in and they had to actually add stuff here and there and they had to cut it short because for 20 minutes the bass and the piano kept playing and playing and he just kept dancing and dancing and he ran out of the studio and they were wondering what the heck's going on with him. And he was dancing. He said, I had to get it out. He goes, he got high off of the music. And he went back in there and then finally started singing and added the lyrics. 
And then they had to take that tape back and they had to cut it off at a point and they had to go back in and add different different uh, beats and stu- stuff to it. But, I mean, it was it was a great song on Off the Wall, but to me, his biggest album was Thriller because he actually pushed yeah. it because he he got disappointed for the fact that he didn't win a Grammy that year for his solo debut. And so it pushed him, motivate him. He's like, I'm coming back next year. And he came back and he was the talk with winning all the Grammys, man. He was in almost every category. And well, that's, uh, that's kind of like B- BTS right now. Uh, they even did a tribute in the middle of one of their performances at one of the award shows of dynamite. And right in the middle, everything goes black. And people thought, what happened? Something went wrong. And then when the lights came back up, they were in a form, formation uh, of uh, some of the stuff that Michael did uh, from The Wall and from Thriller. You know, it was an actual tribute uh, to him. Right. It was actually, uh, I don't know if you saw that or not, but it was a phenomenal. Uh, Jay Hope of BTS, he was up front. And uh, wow, I mean, the shadows and the way his body posture and everything looked. It looked like you were looking at Michael Jackson. Wow. It was really great. And, uh, of course, they're fantastic. They're the biggest thing that's hit music in 50 years, you know. And um, I really enjoy them so much. And, you know, and it brought back to me, you know, I used to dance a lot when I would front the bands I was with. Uh, you know, I was a front man as well as a multi-instrumentalist. Of course, I went on, you know, do all the wrestling uh, theme work and everything, too, and played in the Gentries and so on and so forth. But... Um, I've been dancing uh, every night for about 30 minutes. Uh, I have uh, some stuff on streaming that I pull up that's like jazz, kind of jazz, funk, uh, house-type music that you call. Um, but I'd forgotten how much that, how it felt to, when you dance and, and you know how to dance to a certain degree. It, it's a it's a high, it's unbelievable. It, it's... Uh, your whole existence is in another plane while you're doing the moves and stuff. Now, I never was, uh, have done, I haven't done very much synchronized dancing like BTS does. They're the best in the world at that, and, and great individual dancers too. But um, I just freestyle dance, but I'd forgotten how pleasurable that was. And because a lot of the generations that came after me, they didn't care, they didn't care about dancing. And my son, uh, he's 17, and they don't really care about dancing, you know. But our generation, man, we we cut a rug every time we could. That was our social thing, you know. We'd go to the dances. Of course, I was usually playing at them. Yeah. But what I'm getting at is I really like to dance, and um, I'm, I'm a pretty decent dancer. I don't want to brag on myself, but uh, I can do uh, primarily most of the stuff that BTS does as far as upper body stuff and leg work. I can do all that still, even at my age. Right, but now all that rolling around and stuff and and all that is a little bit different. But uh, I could do that if pressed. But but I still got all the good upper body movements, you know. And as you can see there, uh, <laughs> I'm still limber, and um, I just love it. And I I, I love BTS. Uh, uh, I don't want to monopolize a whole show about BTS, but I think it's worth mentioning because uh, I found out that almost thirty percent of their audience is people over fifty, wow. older than you. No way. So, so yeah, but they've done a lot of great charity work. Unbelievable! They they're uh, they're the figureheads for UNICEF now. They've spoken at the United Nations twice on world unity, um, and they're just fabulous performers and and excellent singers and dancers and you know and plus they actually play some instruments and they claim that before it's over with they're going to do an album where they're going to play all their own instruments. That's amazing. So that should be interesting. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna have to check it out. I'm. I definitely am gonna have to check it out. I bought a lot of CDs here lately in the last few months. I ended up getting a hundred and one CD uh, changer, and I probably got it almost about halfway filled up. And I've regained regained some of the albums I've lost along the way over the years, and I picked up some that I've never had that I came across and I picked them up and. I have a variety of music in the in that CD player. I mean, I have everything from Metallica, Black Sabbath, to Tom Petty, 
to Billy Joel, to Willie Nelson, yes, Willie Nelson, and everything from Blues Travelers to Third Eye Blind to Smashing Pumpkins, all the way to The Who and The Doors and Jimi Hendrix. And well, you only lack two things. You only lack Frank Sinatra, Elvis, and BTS. Yes. <laughs> Get them in there. But I like Blues Traveler. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> Bravo, man. I love that. I love that. I have that one Blues Travelers album. It has run around on it because it was like their, their one, the one album there. And... I, I picked up like defying like albums. I I made myself a list of albums that I need to have before I die, and that's one of the albums I have right there. As like Blues Travelers, yeah, I'm gonna get it, and I got it. Uh, I even have an Oasis album. What's What's the story of Morning Glory? I have that that's one. That's good. That's that's, that's a good, good one. It has one of my favorite songs in it. Don't look back in anger. I mm-hmm. love that song. Uh, Wonderwall, I love that too, and then I also got their one, their one Supersonic. I have that one there, the the one they put out in '94, before uh, before that one there, and then Dave Matthews Band. I have them. I I my wife don't really care too much for them, but I I love them because their drummer he is so talented. That guy, yeah, he is so talented. They got YouTube. There's YouTube version of uh, videos of him just drumming and just him doing the fills. I love when he does the fills and just how he's just all over the place, but he, he, he stays in rhythm, man. He stays in rhythm. <laughs> yeah. He's great. Uh, the wind player, the guy who plays the wind instruments is awesome. They're, they're all real good. You know, they made it big with the uh, college audience. You know, they've been around a while now, a couple of decades, but uh, they were like REM I had an opportunity to play with REM. I think I might have told that on one of the other interviews. Uh, Before they were REM, you know, they were based out of Atlanta, and they were called something like Apple Corps, or they had some kind of different name. But uh, I was in the national international musicians referral uh, thing where you pay like 200 bucks, and you have a lifetime listing uh, to be available for different groups. I had a, a group called the Rolling Clones, they were the top Rolling Stones tribute band, and they were even endorsed by Mick Jagger and, and the guys. You know, they really liked them. Wow. And approved approved of them. But they were, they were interested in having me play drums for them, but they were based out of England. Right. And uh, But I, I told them, I said, it sounds great, but, I, you know, I, I don't want to really do cover music. You know, I, I've done that a lot of my career coming up, but now I want to do original material, so, but thank you, but no thanks, and uh, whatever, but then I got this call from these guys with this this group from Atlanta, and uh, I was talking to Michael Stipe, and um, he said, I said, what kind of music do you do? And he said, well, it's it's different, it's, it's new, it's a new type of kind of a sound that they're calling alternative. Well, as soon as I heard that, I thought I wasn't really interested because it wasn't. I'm more of a straight-ahead rock drummer, hard rock, reggae. You heard me do some reggae and stuff. And, yes. You know, I'm, I'm more of a progressive drummer, and uh, that the drumming on that music is very simplistic and and okay and everything. But I'm more of an advanced top drummer, and uh, but anyway, he described what they were doing, and uh, he said we've got two record uh, companies looking at us next week for at two auditions and whatever and. But I said, well, I appreciate it, but I'm sure you guys are, I wish you well, but alternative really isn't what I'm looking for, but thank you anyway. And then like a little over a year later, here they were, REM, they changed their name to REM and they were the biggest thing in music. Yeah. Yeah. REM, I have, I have one of their albums too. I have Monster. I have that one right there because it has what's the frequency Kenneth it has a uh, man on the moon yeah. the song about Annie Kaufman which yeah. I I mentioned to you not too long ago I finally sat down and watched that movie man on the moon Annie Kaufman about Annie Kaufman's life uh, Jim Carrey played Annie Kaufman and 
I loved it. I loved the I loved the movie, especially the stuff when he got into the wrestling with Jerry Lawler. I loved that stuff because see, I remember watching the original footage of that stuff, pulling it up there, and I I dug it. I I, I loved it. I mean, they went went right along. You know, just about almost exact on what happened. You know, what you saw on camera with the uh, Andy Kaufman and Jerry Lawler. Uh, even even when uh, <laughs> even when Lawler slapped Kaufman on Dave Dave Letterman show, David Letterman still says to this day that is his most highest watched show right there to this date. Yeah. <laughs> because just Kaufman, man, he flew off the handle there, but. A lot of people didn't know back behind this behind the curtain. It was J- Lawler and Kaufman were friends, but Jim Carrey kind of went a little bit crazy. Got into the character when he was doing the movie because he actually used what you saw on camera and intimidated Lawler. Because I watched that Netflix documentary about Jim Carrey recorded all the stuff he did during uh, when he was doing man on the moon and Lawler wanted to kill him twice. <laughs> he wanted to kill him. And he did years later, apologize to Lawler. He said, I'm sorry, you know, for acting like that, you know, and he gave him a gift, which was the robe that he wore in the movie. He gave it to him and he gave him a bunch of old vintage records that was done by wrestlers in the 70s and 80s he gave him that his, that collection to say he was sorry but Kaufman and Lauer I just I just loved loved that feud man because it was just it was so great it was so great man <laughs> it's one of my favorite things of any Kaufman besides the uh um the uh what do you call it the other character he dressed up as uh tony uh Cl- tony clifton tony clifton <laughs> what i liked about the documentary when i watched with jim carrey he 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 got to do the tony clifton thing he on universal the studios there where they were recording the movie uh filming the movie he went down to steven spielberg's office and dressed up as tony clifton yelling at his office trying to call out spielberg <laughs> It's Tony Clifton. <laughs> There's actually uh, a couple of different guys played Clifton uh, when uh, uh, that's uh, Bob Zamuda is who that was. That was uh, who did a lot of the writing for Andy Kaufman. Yeah, it was his writer, and uh, Bob Zamuda is a guy who usually dressed up like uh, him, but. Uh, he was sick, ill a couple of times. There was a couple other uh, substitutes because they could put that makeup on about anybody that size and it'd look the same. Yeah. But, uh, 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 and then one time, uh, he uh, Andy Kaufman actually played uh, that character himself. He pl- he played Tony Clifton. Yeah. And, it, and, and he sat out in the audience and said, where is that shrimp of a comedian? And it was him. You know, but nobody they thought that was really a different guy. It was him doing that. And he said, uh, well, I came down to see that shrimp of a comedian. This is bullshit here. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. This is over. So then he just went around back in the back door and took all that crap off and came out late and said, I'm sorry, everybody, that I am late, you know. But he was playing both parts. <laughs> what a genius. That, that guy was... Uh, Oh wow, he was he's a real nice guy in real life. And of course, Jimmy Hart worked with him in a lot of those matches and stuff. And Jimmy told me that he was, you know, behind the scenes and everything. That Andy was one of the most nicest, politest, considerate people you'd ever meet in your whole life. You know? Yeah, yeah. He he was a, he was a comedian, comedian genius, but he didn't want to be called a comedian, and he, he no. wanted to be called an entertainer. That's that's what yeah. he did. He was an he was an entertainer, and I I just love the stuff that he did there. He he was just it just it made you scratch your head, but then also at the same time you were laughing along with him because you knew he was laughing inside. Like <laughs> I got <gotcha. laughs> you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was a real genius, and it's a uh, unbelievable. It's too bad that he wasn't a bigger person and. He could have been one of the greatest wrestlers that ever lived of being able to talk like that and everything. It had been a bigger guy, you know, and muscular. But, of course, that was part of the gimmick was that he'd come in and he'd challenge any woman in the Coliseum. I challenge, I will beat any woman that comes up here. You remember that was his 
one of his challenges and yeah oh pe- people just love that to death you know <laughs> i mean that was all, that was all awesome you know and these women uh, coming up there and uh, getting pinned and whatever of course they about beat him a couple of times right right yeah they 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 did almost beat him about a couple of times but he he did that to get heat on him and then yeah. that, that's when yeah. uh, Jer- Jerry Lawler he started the thing there in Memphis wrestling with the uh, you know going there and uh, it put Memphis wrestling on the map there and it put Jerry Lawler oh, on yeah. the map because yeah. on letter especially that uh, that segment that incident when he slapped Kaufman on uh, Letterman there and people, mm-hmm. you know, want to see Memphis wrestling. They're going to Memphis, check this out to see Jerry, Jerry, the King Lawler. And it's just, it was, it was great publicity. It was, that was also, well, you know, uh, uh, Vince McMahon and WWF turned him down. He went to them to start with. And, uh, they said, no, that, that, this would cheapen what we're trying to do. And so then he went down to Mid-South. And, uh, uh, you know, Jimmy Hart wound up with a lot of uh, Andy's personal effects. Andy asked Jimmy to store some of the stuff that he'd used on some of the angles and stuff in the shows. Uh, He had a couple of big suitcases or whatever stuff, and he asked Jimmy if he would hold them for him. Well, in the meantime, you know, he passed away, got sick, and then died, and Jimmy had a couple of big trunks of his, a uh, lot of his stuff. Wow. And and so he called, uh, I think, Kaufman's wife or girlfriend or whoever, and uh, I think she told him, she said, there's just a couple of items that she wanted back, but she told, uh, I think she told Jimmy to keep the rest of it and uh, give some of it to the museums uh, and keep, you know, some for himself. So I don't know exactly what he kept and what he gave, but I'll find out. In the meantime, we'll talk about that on the next show. <laughs> but but, but um, then I saw a promo last night from 1984. Jimmy Hart came out. Man, what a great promo. And Dave Brown was standing there, speechless as usual, and because, uh, you know, everybody else does all talking. And uh, he said, you know, I'm a, Jimmy said, I'm an important man, you know, Dave Brown. I'm an important man. He said, people know me from Coast to Coast. They saw me on the live wrestling show Coast to Coast day before yesterday. I'm a big man, and I'm an important man, but I'm going to tell you something right now. I have a guy here that now that I'm renaming, and his name, he's going to be my bodyguard, and Lawler and none of those guys are going to get close to me because now and I'm renaming him. His name is Jimmy Hart, Jr., and I forget the wrestler that it was, but he's a great, big, bodacious uh, Afro-American guy. Uh-huh. You, have you ever seen that promo? No, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look oh, it up. Pull that, pull that up. <laughs> it, he says, he says oh, "I want to. I want y'all to meet my new bodyguard. He is now known as Jimmy Hart Jr. <laughs> it's this big Afro Afro American wrestler, you know. Um, and he said, "That's right, Jimmy. We're not taking any crap off of Lawler and his bunch." And oh, it was a fabulous. Uh, Jimmy uh, ran it on for ten minutes. You know, great. Yeah. Yeah, he, I, I pulled up, I pulled up some stuff back on Rowdy Roddy Piper. I was doing some research for when I had that, uh, that short commentary gig for, for the wrestling promotion down here in Florida, and I was trying to pull some from old school stuff. I was pulling from different people, and then Rowdy Roddy Piper came to mind, and I was pulling up his commentary stuff that he did on uh, WWF Superstars. Then I went ahead and went further because I'd get caught up. I, I was listening to listening to Piper doing commentary, f- watching clips. I would get caught up on watching all this other stuff. I and I got into a got into watching a lot of Piper's pit segments there. And I watched one where Jimmy came out and uh, Rowdy tied him up to the chair. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and then slapped him in the back of the head about three times. And I asked Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, when he was slapping you in the head, I mean, that he was really slapping you. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, that, that had to hurt some. He said, I just stung a little bit. But, you know, he said, uh, but I wouldn't, uh, Lawler didn't tell me he's going to do that. And, oh. you know, Lawler broke his jaw. Really? Uh, yeah. He had a gimmick where the, he's going to throw, he threw a punch to hit Lawler, or Lawler was supposed to slap him. 
Yeah, but but Lawler was mad at him about something. I don't know. Now, uh, occasionally, I've heard these stories about Jerry doing things like that, and uh, he uh, actually punched Jimmy real hard in the jaw and cracked Jimmy's jaw. Ooh. And and Jimmy went to the doctor, and they said, "Well, you got a hairline fracture. We really should wire it up." But uh, so you won't have troubles later in life with it. Jimmy said, "But or you can just elect to do nothing but lay low and don't." take any chances of getting slapped or anything for a while and see what happens. And so Jimmy said, I'm just going to see what happens. So he didn't have it wired up, but Lawler actually broke his jaw, you know, cracked his jaw. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, and Lawler always said, he said, Jimmy, I, I really didn't mean to do that, but I think, you know, Lawler has a, a temper, uh, has a temper, you know, and, you know, he he's broke, he broke, uh, of course he had, broke his own leg doing some stuff, but, uh, I think it, uh, he he broke a couple other people's uh, wrists and and legs along the way too, you know. So, right, got to be careful. You don't want to get Jerry mad at you, <laughs> or he'll stretch you. He'll stretch you or break something. So, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, we were talking about that Jimmy and I were the other night, and uh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, I've been watching a lot of the older clips and stuff, and how energetic that. The events were, and uh, every everything was power packed and a perfect ten. Really, I mean everything. There wasn't any dull matches or slow stuff or filler or cutaways to dull stuff. Uh, it's right. just boom, 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 boom. As soon as that curtain opened, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. I I don't watch Raw or SmackDown anymore. I just don't because it just it nothing nothing grabs my attention anymore like like the how it was in the 80s and the 90s that just it don't grab my attention now AEW on Wednesday nights I'm watching that and then this past weekend I went back and I watched NXT because they show mm -hmm. it on the WWE network and NXT was good. They they were running that uh, Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic that they do yeah. every year, and they were doing that. And they added something this year. They decided to do a women's Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, and mm -hmm. that that was entertaining. It was it was it was great. Just tag team wrestling. I know I I've talked to people who they say they don't really like tag team wrestling that much. I do because I, I like how the strategy is. When yeah. you have a good heel yeah. team, yeah, I like how they yeah. cut the ring off and they get the they get their opponent in the corner and they're beating them down. They're tagging in and out, and one guy distracts the ref while the ref has his back turned. You got him over there getting strangled illegally, choke hold in the corner, and then when the ref turns back around, the guy throws his hands up like. I ain't doing nothing, and the guy's like, "What happened? I don't know." And then when the ref turns back around, it's choking him. I, I mean, I just love that. And the guy's trying to get in, and then once he gets an advantage, an opening, and then <coughs> they do a <coughs> couple, Excuse couple spots here and there, and then they're both knocked out, and then that double down, and that you know, going for the hot tag, and the crowd's just clapping, wanting to see it. And then when they do that double tag, and then both fresh guys come in, and it's just it's just like wow, the place erupts. I love that energy about tag team wrestling. And me too. There's there's been quite a bit of a lot of good tag. I mean, there's been a lot of good tag teams in wrestling that I've that I've seen, and I know you've seen too. That that are just dynamite. They work so good together in the ring. The chemistry you you see it right there. And demolition demolition yeah demolition was gr fantastic man and road warriors that was that's another team that comes to mind um the midnight and the rock and roll express midnight express rock and roll express um what is it the uh killer bees the yeah yeah uh, b brian blair yeah mm -hmm. that's that's a team right there i mean even in the 90s jumping jim brumzell yeah, jumping, jumping, Jim runs out. Yeah, oh, those uh, those guys are all great guys, and I'm so happy that you now I got to do a majority of all that icon music for all those people yeah. of that era. 
But beyond that, uh, they were all a real nice bunch of guys and real sincere, and they really respected. Uh, they I never heard one ugly word ever mentioned about Luthez or Gorgeous George or you know the older timers. By that time, those guys were uh, old timers or they were dead or on the way out or whatever. But uh, all those wrestlers of the '80s and up uh, in that era, the modern golden era, I call the Hulk Hogan era. Right. Uh, they're all all really, uh, really respectful guys of the business and other people and other people's feelings. And he had a few rivalries in there, you know, and whatever here and there. But but the respect was great for the old uh, school, you know. And uh, a lot of the youngsters today, they don't. Uh, you know, I've asked uh, guys that teach seminars and stuff to a lot of these independent wrestling companies up in Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee and whatever. Yeah. And I'd go up and I would go up and ask them. I say, uh, "Are you familiar with the wrestler uh, Ed Strangler Lewis?" They just look at me like, "Who's that?" You know, they don't they don't pay that much attention to the roots of wrestling and the beginnings of it and the what built it into something that brought it up to the level that it's at today and they you know that they're, they're so headstrung on wanting to get to WWE you know you say what's your goal in wrestling son to get to WWE well yeah that's like saying if you're a musician what's your goal uh, Mr. McGuire uh, my goal is to be on uh, Epic Records and I wound up on Epic Records uh, lucky for me uh, you know uh, it's like a musician wanting to uh, have their music on one of the best labels or whatever. So there's nothing wrong with, I don't think, with the youngsters saying, I want to get WWE. But here's the thing. To get to WWE, you've got to go through a lot of other trials by fire to even be able to sit there and say, I want to get to WWE. I mean, you know, you got to get out there and do independent shows. I mean, look at John Cena and Hulk Hogan and even Andre and all these people, uh, greatest of all time, they all did little shows in front of fifty people. Some, you know, when they got gone, when they started, right. And you've got to uh, uh, those uh, goals are. It's good to say you want to, but saying and doing are two different things, as we know. And I think a young youngster starting out in wrestling, in my opinion, would do well to say that. First of all, I want to be one of the greatest independent noticed wrestlers that's ever been in independent wrestling. And then from there, I might be able to perform for WWE or AEW, you know. Right. But right. you're not you're not going you're not going to buy a set of boots and tights and get on WWE 2 months later. You can't do it. Uh, you've got to prove yourself in anything you do in life. I don't care regular job, music, wrestling, sports, Football, basketball, I don't care. Everybody, I mean, even Hank Aaron had to prove himself. And look how he did it. Not only did he have to prove it, he could prove it with his skills pretty easy. But he had to overcome that racial barrier and everything. He had a lot of big uh, ass uh, proven to do. But he did it eloquently. He did it without any violence. He did it without bad-mouthing everybody in the business. He, he just he took a, a licking and kept on ticking, one of the greatest athletes of all time. But he worked his way up from just a little, you know, park uh, b- baseball game and as a kid and whatever. And so my point I'm making is no matter what you're involved in and want to become, you have to go through the steps to achieve that and be willing to. And uh, that's what separates the men from the boys and the girls from the women. And uh, WWE is a great place, don't get me wrong. Uh, It is a pinnacle of contemporary wrestling. But there are a lot of other things going on, too, that are just as important in different ways. But uh, you've got to prove yourself. And, uh, you know, John Cena started out up here in Ohio. He was uh, working up here at Ohio Valley Wrestling. Right. And he was real good, you know. And he's cocky. You know, he knew he was good. He knew he was better than most of those guys coming up. But as time went on, you uh, may have heard him talk. He said, I, I came to realize that 
I realized I was advanced, but I realized that I didn't know everything. And I, when I got up here at WWE, he said I realized how much I didn't know that I right. thought I knew. And he became more humble. But, uh, you know, you just got to work your way up in everything. You know, that's what it is. And a lot of young people today, they don't want to have to work their way up. They want to, they think they can buy their way to the, uh, to the success, you know, yeah. money will fix it, you know, Ex exactly, Can't do it. exactly. You got to pay your dues. You, you got to, you do a lot of, a lot of people that's on WWE right now. I'd say, for example, Seth Rollins. Look how long he he busted his butt in the independent circuit. Kevin Owens, that's another one there. AJ Styles, nice guys, mm -hmm. nice guys, both of them. And you take them out of the building and talk to them, and they're like, we're talking now. They're they're very humble guys. You know, I don't I don't think that they really expected to ever to really make it all that that far in a way. Uh, it's kind of like. Um, the one member of BTS, uh, his name's Ty Young, is, they call him V. He said, you know, this is all unbelievable to me because I was born poor. I never thought my whole life in, a, in any wildest dream of my imagination that I would be famous one day. Right. So, you know, it, it's, you, you, you know it's, it's just it's different. It's just something that doesn't, doesn't happen for everybody. But if you're diligent and you're good, and you're willing to treat people right, and you're willing to suck it in when you can always open your mouth and say a lot of stuff, but don't. You know, knowing when not to say something is just as important as knowing when to say something. And Jimmy Hart, he's a prime example of that to me and a lot of other people. He did what they told him. He told me, he said, McGuire, I knew that when I was out there and I saw Bobby Heenan running around the ring, he said, I knew that Bobby was probably getting paid double or more than I did. But he said, but I was happy to be there and be amongst the greats and learn from them. So I was good with it. I didn't ever complain. I didn't ever run up to the office and go, I, boss, I want more money. I'm worth it, you know, like they right. do now. Uh, he took what he got, and he was happy with it, and he didn't ever rock the boat. And look at look how it turned out for Jimmy Hart, you know. And mm -hmm. and by the way, for the fan, for the fans listening, Jimmy Hart told me that his favorite wrestling manager of all time was Bobby Heenan. But he also told me that of the modern uh, managers, or rather valets, or whatever uh, advisors, whatever you want to call them, that uh, he really likes you know who. You tell me. Yeah. Tell me the name. Uh, Who's the best manager they've got in the business up there? Right now? Right now. Paul Heyman. Bingo. You know your <laughs> wrestling. Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. He's a great mouthpiece. Paul He's Heyman. A, Jimmy he, Hart said, I was kind of taken back by that. I never thought about Paul Heyman. Uh, I mean, Paul Heyman's excellent. But Jimmy Hart said that he's the best uh, of that of that position of an individual in the entertainment thing yeah. of what it is, you know. Right. Uh, I don't know what do they call Paul an advisor? Or I'm not even sure what do they call him. He's the advocate. He calls himself the advocate. Okay, he was, Ad advocate. Okay, every yeah. year it's something different. Another yeah. word. He was the, he was the he called himself the advocate for Brock Lesnar. But yeah. what I like is I like how <laughs> since Lesnar <clears throat> is gone now. And he's pretty much done. But they've they've got that guy that looks like him that they're going to promote. Well, the, you seen that they, guy? They stuck they stuck uh, they stuck Roman Reigns with with Paul Heyman, which I think is great because Paul, Roman went bad like everybody wanted, and I I love that he they he kind of changed his look, but not too much. One thing he got he made him get rid of was that vest, which I think is that, great. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, that vest yeah. was pissed. Uh, that vest looked like something left over from a B-rated science fiction movie. <laughs> but what what he's doing, and even with his cousins, the Usos and stuff, I I think that's I think that's great because the, he's uh, keeping that Samoa heritage thing. And Heyman yeah. is just great. He fits perfect in that and doing that right there with uh, Roman Reigns there. Well, well, who is who is that guy that looks like Lesnar? Oh. What's his name? 
Mm, man. And from what I've what I've read, it's they're gonna they're gonna actually kind of push him like a Lesnar Jr. Oh, uh, oh damn. He looks like him. He looks yeah. like a younger version. The guy looks like him. Yeah, I can't I can't think of the name because I I do watch the pay per views each month you know, because like the next weekend that's this coming up is going to be the Royal Rumble. I'm wondering how yeah. how they're going to do that. I wonder I wonder who's going to win it this year because Drew won it last year and who won it for the women last year? I think it was who the hell won it? Charlotte. Yeah. Charlotte. Yeah. Charlotte yeah, yeah. won it for the women's last year. Drew Drew McIntyre won it last year for the men's. <clears throat> I wonder. I wonder who they're going to push this year because there's there's a lot of talent. But I what I loved about last year was the return of Edge. That that was mm -hmm. amazing. Nine nine years, nine years. Mm -hmm. The man. And what I love, and I probably talked about this with you. What I loved about this was when he came out there. And the reaction he got, you could see it on his face. It was like, it's like he was about to cry. Like these, it's like your fans have never left you. And they've always been here, and they've welcomed you back. And I mean, he shut down that rumor for months. Yeah, you're you're doing no, no. Uh, I'm not. He had he had to keep a tight lid on it when it was about to come come out. Nope. And then. When he came out there, man, that the roof blew off. They're still looking for it, I think. <laughs> well, he uh, Edge uh, came in and kind of had a his own audience, so to speak, to me, mm -hmm. uh, eight, you know, uh, age bracket wise and whatever. And uh, you know, uh, he he was you know he's he's something else. You know, now nobody's going to sit here and doubt that WWE they they know talent when they see it. Yes, you know, and they know they know uh, they they uh, usually they know what talent to promote up front and what to put in the middle and whatever else. But uh, you you gotta you gotta really be great to to work for WWE. Uh, now there's a lot of independent wrestlers that are ready for WWE actually, but uh, you know they have to find them and see them mm -hmm. and whatever. But WWE knows how to uh, get the right people and. It, the only problem they have is what anybody has a problem with in movies or books or anything is storyline. Uh, it's not a snap to come up with a storyline that keeps fans coming back for years. Right. You know, and like Bob Backlund, for example, that guy, th they had such a stretch of a storyline for him. I mean, he just kept people coming back and back and back and back and back for, you know, decades you know <laughs> right. and uh they but they had their uh the storyline uh was really really compelling to people and fans and gave them what they wanted and more um you know i think the uh like for movies example uh, the right there's not that good of scripts these days overall because uh, the writing ability of uh they don't have the uh mass of exceptionally talented writers that they had in the 50s and 60s and 70s even, you yeah. know. And you got to have people come up with, you know, storylines and grudges and things that, that really appeal to the people. And it's not simple because it's like music. Every chord has already been used in a song somewhere, but your goal is to try to fashion these chords in a new way to make it sound different, you know. Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, the basic formula, and you just got to change it up a bit to get people into what what you're doing, like sound-wise and, and lyric-wise, because everything comes together in some shape or form to get people to listen to, listen to what you what you creative, being creative. Well, our, uh, uh, Jimmy and mine's greatest uh, songs were, uh, you know, the, the lyrics uh, that Jimmy wrote, you know, to the music that uh, I came up with and whatever. He pretty much gave me leeway on the music to come up with what I wanted that would fit it, and then he would make some suggestions, whatever, about tempo and so on. But I came up with the bulk of all the music, and he came up with the bulk of all the lyrics. And the other day I was talking with somebody. They were talking about how they liked the uh, Rougeau brother theme, you know, kind of comedy theme there. 
And I said, well, that that theme wouldn't have been anything without Jimmy's words. Uh, you know, those words made that. The, the music to it was just medium-type stuff. wasn't anything monumental or anything. But with his words and those lyrics and then the combination of the little music and, and those lyrics uh, really put it over. And right. uh, you got to have that combination, you know. And then a lot of the stuff was instrumental. Of course, I, I, I came up with all that. Jimmy wasn't even around when I wrote the majority of the instrumental tracks, uh, you know. He would call me and say, uh, you know, demolition needs something, so see what you can fish up and then call me and then. I'd have an idea, and I'd call him and play it over the phone. He'd go, yeah, go ahead and develop that out. And then then we got together. Uh, you know, he would sit there and write the words out, uh, usually at the Coliseum in the back. And that's how we did it. But but I think, uh, like, Sexy Boy, that was the most played theme in wrestling history. And, um, you know, again, uh, Jimmy's lyrics uh, made that great. I'm so cool, I'm so sexy, you know, and all that. And But the combination of the way that we – work and put that stuff together, you know, uh, really entertain the people, and that was our goal. We we weren't trying to come up with stuff that entertained us. We, we thought hard and worked hard at coming up with what would satisfy the fans, you know, what they would expect. Right. And um, that's that's how we got lucky and and did what we've done and everything, too, is that, that we, we knew uh, we had a finger on the pulse of the of the people that come to wrestling matches, and we both knew wrestling pretty good for outsiders. We knew wrestling as good as about any other outsider, and so we knew what people expected and what people were listening for, and and we came up with what we did to satisfy the people. Again, I, I've had people say, well, your ego must be pretty good to have written some of the greatest iconic wrestling themes ever written. I went, not really. I said, it's just what I do, and I'm having a good time at it, but I didn't write that music for my ego. I wrote that music, and Jimmy uh, did lyrics, and we both worked together on that music for the world's ego. Yeah. We wanted to satisfy, you know, the ego of the people and right. not so much our, our own personal ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you gave a sound to a character. You matched up something with a the character there, and talking talking about the the songs and the themes that you and Jimmy Hart did here lately I was I've been looking back and forth on uh, your Facebook there and you put out there the uh, Superfly Snuka theme you mentioned uh, about that there you you said you did that in the uh, in your bedroom in there and you 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 did the uh, Superfly Superfly you that was your voice there and the million dollar man Ted DiBiase I didn't really know how that story went there and you explained it I, I seen you and listened to you on a couple other podcasts there and you explained how you came up with the million dollar man theme which I thought was fantastic as like it just all clicked there and the superfly theme and even Shawn Michaels sexy boy just some great amazing themes and I want to take a quick break and let's give a word from our sponsors. When I want to kick back a few cold ones with my friends, I head over to City Limits Tap Room. City Limits Tap Room has a wide selection of TVs to watch your favorite sports, indoor and outdoor seating. They are pet friendly. City Limits Tap Room also has food made fresh to order, and the grilled cheese is excellent. I recommend the grilled cheese and the apple pie cider. The fries on the side. Can't go wrong with that, baby. For more information for upcoming events, head over to facebook.com slash city limits tap room. Keep up with the latest shows and content from Podcast City Network over on podcastcity.net. Follow them on facebook.com slash podcast city network. Twitter at podcast city net. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Podcast City Network, on Twitch, Podcast City Network. Podcast City Network, the top source for independent podcasting. Be creative, be yourself. You're listening to The Everett Lee Show.
put this up the last couple days, you put up the end credit song for Thunder in Paradise. Catchy. I watched it today. I remember when I used to watch the show when it was back on TV there, and that song would play. And I'd sit there and sing along with it, you know, Thunder in Paradise. You know, mm-hmm. just just a great beat to it there. I was trying to remember who sang on that. That was a, a true Jamaican guy that we hired. I can't remember his name without going back and looking it up on the sheet that we have. But uh, he's a he's a full blooded Jamaican, uh-huh. and we fit, we I mean Jimmy and I both could sing that fine. But it would just be a couple of typical Caucasian guys trying to sound like reggae. So we figured, let's get a real reggae guy to sing it. Yeah. And that's, when the tongue come down in paradise. You know, that, he really, he's got the accent and everything. But he's a real true 100% Jamaican Rasta guy. Yeah. So uh, that, that, that gave more authenticity to the theme, too, you know. Right. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, that was... Uh, I wrote that thing within about five minutes. <laughs> I I remember I remember at the one podcasting network one year anniversary. You pulled that out of there, man. You played that. I I was like, this is great hearing this live after seeing on the yep. show for so many years. What back in the day when it came on TV and I'd watch it, and then you performing it live. I'm like, man, this is just great. That's when um that's when Tyler McDermott was sitting there and he was like. Dude, this is like the greatest moment of my life. You know, here <laughs> it was, man. He was marking out on you when you broke out Thunder in Paradise. We were just like, he's like, yeah. I mean, he was into it. He's like, I remember that show. I was like, yeah, I used to watch it back in the day, man. It was one of my favorite shows I watched. I mean, just it was a good show. Uh, not not just because we did music and were characters on it, but. Uh, the show was done really well. See, the Baywatch uh, producers made that show mm-hmm. uh, in the in the summertime when they had their time off from the Baywatch schedule. That's when they were down at Disney Orlando shooting our Thunder and Paradise show. So they didn't have any. They only had two weeks off a year during that time. It was yeah. like to kill them because they were tired from doing all the Baywatch shows, and then then they had like two weeks off, and then they immediately had to come to Florida. And work all summer on the, the Thunder and Paradise series, and but uh, uh, it was an excellent show, and it was shot well. And uh, I just wish that somebody would, uh, you know, get a hold of the rights to it all and digitally remaster it all to where I mean, if you could see it, I've got some old beta tapes of it that look like DVD quality. I mean, the quality of the show is fabulous, but it's hard to see. Most of the episodes you're seeing online have been lifted off of tapes or yeah. recorded off the air or something. You know, the, the picture quality isn't that good. Luckily, the sound is fine. Yeah. But the, pic- yeah. the picture's a little soggy. But I wish that they would, um, somebody, get, uh, you know, uh, put out the whole series digitally mastered the way it should be and uh, let people uh, see the whole series. But... I don't know what the holdup is on that. They they took the first two, uh, they took the pilot and one other show and and combined that, made that, cut that, and made that into a Thunder in Paradise movie that they right. released at the video stores. Yeah. And that all that is is the first, that's the pilot show with an additional uh, two-part episode uh, tied on to it. And, that, and then they're selling that is you can still buy that online and whatever. Right. But uh, but Jimmy and I, are, we're in some of the scenes of that's those two and um, whatever. But I, I wish that that they would, uh, you know, put the show out in a complete box set of the whole thing. Eventually, hopefully, they will. But um, like I said, I've got it on. I've got a, actually. Uh, I got the whole series on VHS tapes. But of course, that stuff all looks weak compared to our. Uh, 1080p and 4K TVs today, you know. Right. So. Right. But you ought to see. You ought to see how it's really shot fabulous. I mean, it's cinematographic. Uh, uh, Jimmy Pergola was the uh, guy that filmed it all, and he's a guy that did uh, the original In Cold Blood uh, movie back in the 60s with uh, uh, Beretta was in it. What's his name that played Beretta? The, that lunatic. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I can't. I can't think. Of him. Of my head. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. But anyway, um, 
that was a great movie. Uh, it was a true movie about a uh, true murder of a family and whatever, but uh, the photography in that movie is phenomenal. But Jimmy Pergola did that. And then Jimmy Pergola also was a master uh, photographer, filmer for all of the Baywatch shows you watched. Mm -hmm. And you know how colorful those were and everything. But, but really, our show was even more dynamic and more colorful than Baywatch. Uh, and if you watched it when it was first released, you know, on uh, Turner TNT and then on Fox and then CBS and whatever, if you watched it on those formats, <coughs> boy, the picture's really great. Yeah, yeah. I, I I pulled up I pulled up some of the footage on on YouTube. There are clips here and there, and it just just the quality. I mean, like you said, some sometimes someone just like records it uh, on a VHS and it puts it up there, and the sound sounds crappy, and they're just mm -hmm. just to show something there. But I I watched I watched the show. I know they did like like you said they had like the pilot uh, pilot episode, which they put out like a movie, and then they did the you know the other episodes followed afterwards for the for the TV show there, and mm -hmm. I I enjoyed it there because it was just it was something different. Never seen anything like it before, and mm -hmm. it would come on. Uh, during the weekends, like on Saturday nights, I remember watching it on Saturday nights or, or I think it was like Sunday afternoons on like the WGN here. And mm -hmm. I'd watch it. I'd, if I was near the TV and it was on, I would watch it. I'd sit there and watch it and I'm like, wow, this is great. And then I got friends to watch it. What are you watching? Thunder in Paradise. What's that? I was like, dude, it has Hulk Hogan in it. And he's like this badass. He's on this boat that can, it's like Night Rider on water. That's the way I explained it. And they're like, no way. I said, yeah, dude, you got to watch this. And I had a couple friends watching with me, and they were like, man, this is just, it's like, we never see anything like this. This is great. And we just sit there and had a good time watching it. I was probably about, I was about 15 at the time, 15 when it came out. And it was just, it was just great because there was nothing like that on TV that was that entertaining, you know? That's right. Uh, the uh, They had uh, some great writers for the show. Um, you know, they had about eight different writers that were all stellar writers. They'd written, one of the guys had written some stuff like for the old Columbo show. He was an older, a little bit older of a writer. But then they had younger writers too. And they'd have a meeting every day. The writers would have a writer's meeting. And I used to sit in on some of the writer's meetings and listen to them discuss his storyline and different things. And, you know, man, that whole experience for me, uh, I learned for what I already didn't know from learning in Hollywood, working at Glen Glen Sound, I picked up the balance of what I didn't know from being on Thunder in Paradise and paying right. attention to all the production aspects and everything. I, I was in every department of Disney. I was in the prop department. Uh, you know, they made some really cool machine gun gimmicks for the boat and uh, grenade launcher things, and I actually watched them put all that together and assemble it and build it. And it was pretty complex stuff. It wasn't cardboard. It was real metal and stuff that really fired stuff for real and could right. be dangerous in the wrong hands, you know. Wow. But it was a it was a very high quality show. Uh, Rusher Entertainment made that show in conjunction with uh, New Line. The actual parent company was New Line Cinema. Okay. Uh, and then that's how Hulk got uh, started making those New Line Cinema movies and stuff too. But yeah. Um, but uh, uh, it was a great show, and I wish – see, Hulk, that's when Hulk got the opportunity. Uh, Eric Bischoff came to him and told him he had a deal to get him in WCW. So, And the money was so big and everything. Plus, it's uh, not as hard to work uh, wrestling as it is making an episodic TV show, believe it or not. Really? It's a lot more grueling making an episodic show when your principal actor, like Hulk, was uh, it's harder work than wrestling. Sure is. <laughs> yeah, because because you just st stuff something go wrong and you get you have a certain time and you got to get this shot done and you got to remember your lines mm -hmm. you know and this you have to do this you're doing a you're doing a fight choreographed fight 
you know, mm-hmm. it, you know, this, it go, it's going like this, got to work out everything. There's so much just to get a shot, just to get a two minute shot takes eight hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, yeah, yeah you're yeah. not exaggerating too much there. Uh, we would report, uh, makeup and hair and all that at, uh, six in the morning. And then by seven in the morning, uh, we'd report to the set, you know, which is usually out there on the beach down uh, where the Glen Florili- Grand Floridian is. And uh, then we'd wait for them to set up all the lighting. And, you know, that all took about another 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, you're just standing by waiting for them to get everything set up. And then uh, after all that's done, then finally you get around to shooting. But like you say, uh, it just if the public knew how much work and time goes into shooting a two-minute scene, uh, they'd be appalled. They, it'd be hard for them to swallow, to believe. But right. Uh, but they were really great people. See, that was all the same technical people that did Baywatch. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Hal, uh, uh, the uh, Ashby guy that did uh, the in charge of the sound. He was a sound guy, did all the sound on location sound for Baywatch. Uh, Jimmy Pergola, the Baywatch uh, Panaflex uh, camera, uh, photo, you know, filmer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. all that staff and all that crew was the same people that did Baywatch. So they had a system down, and that helped a whole lot. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it was really uh, great. One of the greatest experiences of my whole life. Uh, I wish that the show would have lasted a few more seasons, but... I don't blame Hulk for going back to wrestling because that's what he does the best, and right, right. Uh, that's what that's what he loves the most, and and that's why the show left the air. The show wasn't canceled because it wasn't good. Uh, it it left the air because Hulk left and went back to wrestling. Right. He w- he went back to he went back to the thing he loved. I remember that that's when right. uh, he it was ninety four when he went back to when he went back to wrestling and he signed with WCW and when he signed that contract they had that parade there where you drove the Viper that uh, yeah. he auctioned off just last I think it was two years ago a couple years ago he auctioned yep. off there and you drove that there and he signed his contract with WCW and he went back He went back to wrestling you, were, you, you mentioned Baywatch I, I know that I watch a lot of Pluto TV because they got a lot of good content on there. I mean, just some great stuff on there. I I got into the binge watching channels, and I probably mentioned this to you, but yeah, they got a they got a twenty four twenty four seven uh, Baywatch channel. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got I, I get that up here too. I see it. So yeah, and then they they I loved how they redid everything where you could go on the the on the demand section and there's a lot of stuff you can pull up there and just about anything. One night I sat there and I watched back to school at Ronnie Dangerfield. <laughs> that was my dad's favorite movie growing up. It was, I remember watching that. Uh, I, I loved Ronnie Dangerfield, man. I loved the stuff. Oh, me too. One of my me favorite too. comedians, man. Caddyshack. He was great in back to school. Mm-hmm. That, that was, that was great. I mean, he had Sam Kinison in there. <laughs> He's yelling at, <laughs> yelling at him. I, I just, I just love that. And they, they got a lot of, a lot of good content on there on, on Pluto TV. I'm go I, I go through there and check out some stuff. We were talking about dancing earlier. My wife found the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders making the team. And there for a while, we were binge watching that. I'm sitting there watching these beautiful women that's in their like early to mid 20s trying out and just trying to make this football team to, to be on the Dallas Cowboy cheerleader team. And a lot of them, man, they're they're so passionate about it. A lot of them get it so far to where they just don't make it to the training camp. They get cut. And then there's been a few of them that's actually come back, auditioned twice. I think they had one person come back for five years, and that fifth year, finally, it was her year. She did something that they wanted, and they they put her, they took her in there. But just the the expression of dancing that these these ladies do and just the talent they did do and just 
just trying to make this team here because they, they're looking for that it factor and the certain look and they're looking for entertainers and they stress that out through the whole thing <laughs> through the whole like different seasons we're looking for entertainers that's what we yeah. are an entertainer we're looking if you could dance country hip-hop um rock just different styles and be that entertainer and learn the choreograph just like that and what gets me watching it there like I remember remember seeing like someone who was a rookie and then they make the team and then they're in there for about two to three years and then they got a clause in their contract about their weight and if uh, they add or lose weight they get they they're they're gone mm -hmm. they're gone mm -hmm. and a lot of what kills me is and even the people that that run the thing they they get so upset it's like they pull they have to call a veteran in the office you don't they shouldn't have to because of their weight it's like you're you're in violation of your contract you better drop that because you know you have to have this certain it and look and it and i was telling my wife because i said I don't get this. These veterans, they they get in there and they become a veteran for about two, three years, and then they just get lazy. It's like you need to be on top of your game all time. I just mm -hmm. don't, oh, I could sit here and coast in the back. It's like, no, you need to be on top of your game all time. You know, you've rep, you're representing something. Well, you see, uh, Jimmy Hart, Hulk Hogan, Myself, uh, our generation. Now, of course, Jimmy's ten years older than Hulk and me. Hulk and I are right at the same age, and Jimmy's ten years beyond us. But, but even though you see, we still come from the generations of being an entertainer. Uh, you know, uh, our great entertainers are people like Jackie Gleason and Red Skelton and Jerry Lewis and. Dean Martin and you know even as a teenager and whatever you know I liked all those people I mentioned right uh, but they they were great entertainers that's your key word and people audiences still that why do you think they pay and buy a ticket and go to something they want to be entertained right and I, th I think a lot of the idea of being an entertainer is kind of disappeared from show business but I'm referring back to BTS again those guys they're just they're they're entertainers you know they they right. dance they sing it looks to me more like they've picked up the ideas that were used in the 40s and 50s and even 30s you know of remember all your big box office movies uh well I say you remember I wasn't born back then either but <laughs> you know your yeah. your biggest box office movies were dancing and singing their way to success movies, you know. Uh, exactly. That was the basic uh, biggest form of entertainment. But you, like uh, Joseph Yule said, Joseph Yule is known by most of the people listening tonight or today as Mickey Rooney. His real name was Joseph Yule, Y-U-L-E. But he, I listened to Mickey talk so many times about the value of being an entertainer. And I think that a lot of um, entertainer type idioms, ideas, and stuff are kind of being lost and set down by the wayside because there's a certain group of people that thinks that stuff's all outdated and not that interesting and not that entertaining anymore. But right. yet you've got this BTS group that's outsold the Beatles and anything before it, Elvis the Works. And they're, they've made it on a simple premise of dancing and singing. Mm -hmm. dancing, dancing and singing. Dancing and look and what singing. it did. You know, uh, it brought, they, they used the elements of the great great entertainers of yesteryear. They repackaged it in with a modern type of sound and unusual look, them being Korean and whatever. But yet, just good old singing and dancing it's just won the hearts over of millions of people. Those guys have had over a billion views on uh, social media. Over a billion. That's Not, a lot. You know, over <laughs> a billion. They're almost up to two billion in, in one instance. Uh, 
you know, Dynamite, the song Dynamite has been downloaded and viewed a, 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 a billion times. Jeez, that's that's nuts. Man. Yeah, I mean, people people love it. it. People love something. To, that's to that's entertainment, them. brother. That's entertainment. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it is entertainment. It it is entertainment. Yeah. You're you're talking about talking about how how they taken something from like the uh, thirty the thirties and forties and put a modern twist on it. Megan Trainer when she had that song all about the bass. Yeah. You know what that yeah, song, like the mm -hmm. beat, reminded me of? It reminded me of something I would hear at a jukebox in a diner in the 50s, in the, the yeah. late 50s and yeah. 60s, especially during the chorus there. And yeah. th that th that's what it reminded me about, you know, and just the beat and the bass line. It reminded me of something I hear, hear in a jukebox in the diner. And I, I, said, I said to my wife, I said, I said, She's taking something that's old school rhythm and put a modern twist on it, and look, bam! Yeah, I mean, a lot of people loved it. A lot of people loved that. Yeah, song. well, well, if certain forms of entertainment worked before, they will work again. You just have to kind of modernize them, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit. Exactly. Dress it up. Dress it up in modern clothing, and people will like it. But right, right. Uh, you were talking. You know, it, you're talking yeah, about. Go ahead. Um, talking about like old movies when you when you said that about old movies it just reminded me of something i've seen today they're bringing they're doing a modern modern uh movie of godzilla vs king kong finally i saw the trailer the extended trailer last night what oh man i i i cannot wait because i used to watch it, it was good. I, I used to watch the godzilla and king kong what got me was I scrolled through the comments on YouTube and people kept repeating the line they said out of the trailer, Godzilla's hurting people. We don't know why. And and then everyone was just poking poking at that. You go, Godzilla's hurting people. We don't know why. And then there's and all the comments, a lot of it was kinda ridiculous or stupid. And I said, I said to myself, it's like they're gravitating towards that, like they did back with the Ghostbusters Afterlife trailer last year, when that came out. They came out. There hasn't been a ghost uh, disturbance in, uh, since the 1989, where they overlooked the female version, and people were flipping out about that. And now people's flip is like Godzilla's hurting people. We don't know why. Well, you know what? Go watch the movie, and then you'll find out why. And there could be a lot of theories. It could be like the humans did something. They could have, you know, they could have upset him, or there could be something in, with the with the monsters. You know, it's just they they pick one little thing out. People nowadays, and they just keep picking at it like a scab. And I can't stand mm -hmm. that. But I want to see that. And then then and then oh yeah, people are complaining. Oh, King Kong was pounding on Godzilla, and he wasn't doing nothing. There was fighting. He was fighting back in that trailer. I, I just I don't mm -hmm. get it sometimes, JJ. But I I want to see it. I want to see this modern modern Godzilla vs King Kong. I think uh, they said the people that made this one, the people that made that one, with John Goodman. I I didn't care for it. I matter of fact, I watched half of it and turned it off and gave up. But uh, my girlfriend out west, uh, they went and saw it on an IMAX theater. Uh -huh. And uh, she said uh, those effects and stuff, uh, that's all she goes for. She doesn't care about story. They go for the glitz and glamour of the effects, yeah. you know, like the Marvel movies and stuff. Right. And uh, she said that on that big screen, you know, those action sequences were really formidable, and I could see how they would be. Oh, God, but yeah. I But I thought the, the rest of the movie wasn't much. Uh, uh, but now this one here looks like they tuned it up and – Looks a lot better, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give this one a shot. I'm gonna, yeah, I will see this one. Yeah, all the way. I I enjoyed that first one that came out a few years ago. It had the uh, it had the guy from Breaking Bad who was Malcolm in the Middle. He was in it there, and the, the Godzilla. And I didn't see Godzilla King of the Monsters, but I remember seeing uh, Kong Kong or Skull Island. I remember mm -hmm. watching both of those there. So 
I'm I'm happy to see this. I'm excited to see this because I I used to love watching Saturday mornings as old monster movies like Godzilla vs Mothra, King Kong vs yeah. Godzilla. I mean that that stuff was just great, man. It was great. Well, we used to when when we were kids uh, when those were first released. You know, we go to the theater, man, and just sit there and. I mean, we knew it was a couple of guys in suits and stuff running around, but we it still we loved it. You oh, know, it was really fun. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it it was fun. It was fun and entertaining. I I loved I loved seeing that trailer there, and I'm like, yeah, this is great. I I cannot wait to see a. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen Looks haven't good. seen anything like this with with these two icons, like monster icons. Going toe to toe, it's been a long time, man. A long time for a Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, and one talking about old old stuff. There, I have to go back to Pluto TV. I found the Adams Family channel on there, and my three year old, you know, my yeah, daughter Callie, that. she she was seeing advertisements, and she's walking around the house going da 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 da. <laughs> The Adams Family. Sweet. Petite. Yeah, we loved it. Yeah. Do you... I wish they'd put the Monsters channel on there. The one with the Monsters. I love I love watching yeah. the monsters. Mm. My my favorite one of my favorite episodes was when um, when uh, Eddie was running track and his uh, and he's there with his little friend there and he was like he's like he's like yeah we're gonna you know we're gonna run track and he's like you ready there and he's like yeah he's like look it's my dad and when they shot the gun to fire off the run he saw he saw Eddie's dad and he took off running really quick mm -hmm. <laughs> and then. And then Herman's like, "Wow, your your friend's really fast. <laughs> He's trying to get away from him." <laughs> and then when the he got struck by lightning, and he looked normal, and they were all freaking out. <laughs> well, did, did you ever see the one where that Herman became a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> that might be the greatest of all time, you know. He, he's playing this Les Paul and it's smoking. You know, he's burning <laughs> up, you know. To me, that was one of the better ones. He's, he had all the cool sayings, and, you know, uh, that that show was brilliant, man. Mm -hmm. the, all those shows in the 60s, we were so excited during that era when we were kids. Uh, yeah. Everything was exciting. The TV shows were exciting. Christmas was exciting. Uh, Halloween was extra exciting. Everything was real exciting, you know. It was. But all that that's that stuff anymore. Uh, they've kind of knocked all the excitement out of it all, over trying to be politically correct, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, though I understand that, you know, Halloween is based on a lot of pagan uh, ideas, and and Christmas has also been jumbled up with pagan symbols and trying to mix uh, Santa Claus with Jesus Christ and stuff. And I understand people's complaints about that, and I, and I sympathize and I understand that. But we were more innocent then, and, uh, you know, we were more in a celebratory mood, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't think that by uh, thinking about Santa Claus that we were putting God or Jesus on a back burner. Right, but uh, I, but I understand the people that complain about that, and I see that more now that I'm older. I see that, you know, they took a lot of pagan ideas and then tried to tie it in on the back of Jesus and all that, and that's not a very good thing, really, mm -hmm. because really Christmas is about uh, Jesus, even though Jesus wasn't born on Christmas, he was born more like in September or somewhere in there. But you see, um, the uh, 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 the Catholics and the Romans and whatever they, 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 you know, the Sabbath was really Saturday, and the Catholics changed that to Sunday because uh, they knew that people could work on Saturday and do things. But actually, the real Sabbath is on Saturday. But these are things that people don't take time to think about or, or investigate. Right. And and I have and I understand the gripes about. Uh, mixing uh, pagan ideas with uh, Christianity. Christianity and paganism got mixed up together big during the King James Version. 
And uh, but I mean, this debate can go on forever. Right. There's people heard me. There's people out there listening heard me say what I say. They'd want to throw a rock at me or something, and then people would go, "Yes, you're right." Uh, but but what I'm getting back to is we we went to church on Sundays. Uh, we behaved ourselves. We had fun at Christmas. We watched the Adams Family and the Munsters and all those shows, and we had a lot of fun. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I think back about every night at one time or another. I think about how much fun that we had back in the 60s, you know, when we were little kids. Right, right. I I remember in the 80s as a little kid, that, that, was, that was a good time there. In the mid-80s to the... To the to the late eighties, there mid mid to late eighties, there when I was a kid growing up, even or even in the early nineties, there when I was still a kid, I remember it was just like Freddy Friday Friday the Thirteenth. That stuff was big. That was big right there. Halloween, I think it was like the fourth or fifth one. Michael Myers, just yeah, just good. stuff like that. There, I think like the Goonies, the Lost Boys was out yeah. and and then like back to the future those, those movies the outsiders don't forget the outsiders yeah outsiders yeah yeah that that movie right there started a lot of big name career uh actors that mm-hmm. came out of that movie there um just just a lot of a lot of good stuff i i know what you mean like during even during the 90s they had when I mean, there was some great stuff that was going on in the '90s, and I I t- talk about that and mention that quite a bit. I mean, '90s when I was a teenager, that's when I graduated high school. A lot of stuff happened. I remember when the internet first came out, and it was in the school library. Email. I remember the big like the they had the half inch. Uh, I remember as a kid, the big floppy disk, and then they got them down to a half inch, and we used to. Like when you bought a computer and you wanted to put Windows ninety five on it before they actually did like the CDs, you had to put them on. You had twelve half inch floppies you had to put in and out, and that's how you save stuff. I remember I had a friend who had like a bunch of uh, floppies in his uh, hiding in his room, and it was like, "What's that?" And he's like, "Check this out." Popped it in there, took forever. Boom, load up, and all of a sudden you see the little thumbnails going all the way across, and it's like, "What's that?" And he's like check it out and it was like oh is that pam anderson she ain't wearing a stitch of clothes and it takes forever the picture to load and all of a sudden it was like it's like he's like johnny what you doing in there oh shoot you got to click yeah. it off click 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 and it <laughs> start over <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah you're looking at there's naked yeah. women and it's just like <laughs> it's like yo uh, i gotta go dude you in trouble <laughs> We've come a long way. We've come a long way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can, you you just, just how technology's come a long way there. CDs was great. I used to go to the mall on the weekends. Friday, I couldn't wait to get out of school Friday. My cousin come by, pick me up after school. It's like, let's go to the mall. Go out to the mall. Check, get like the latest CDs that were coming out. And then right next door was the movie theater. Hey, what do you want to go see? Let's go catch a movie. Go catch a movie, man, and then get home late. It's like, wow, get home, put on your new CD and your CD player, and I'd sit there and fall asleep listening to it next day, you know, and just get up. And and then PlayStation first came out, Sega Saturn, just, you know, video game, play some video games, or go out, you know, go back out to the mall, see your friends, and just different things. It was just I remember... Speaking of video games, uh, I remember buying Pong. You know, it was the first video game. Mm-hmm. And uh, and when I, I bought Pong, and I'm not kidding, I was up for two days straight playing Pong, playing Pong, <laughs> black and white Pong. Yeah, and and wow. and just thought that was the coolest thing I ever saw anywhere. Right now, look now look PlayStation Five compared to Pong is like, you know, comparing. Uh, the water coming out of one drip of your faucet to all the water in the world, you know. <laughs> but but uh, but yeah, I, I never forget that. And then all my buddies, the buddies would come over and and hang and for hours and hours and hours on end playing pong. And then when I played, when I joined the Gentries, 
the most two most popular video games at the bars that we played, the clubs and whatever, was Asteroids, black and white, once again, <laughs> and uh, and Pong, Pong and Asteroids. Uh, they had the sit down table version uh, also of Asteroids at the bars. Those things made more money. I actually had two of them on two locations in uh, L.A. County. Uh, I had a, a video game route and had upright, you know, arcade, full size arcade games. Uh, right. And uh, and that that darn that darn asteroids that and Galaga made me more money than anything <laughs> until 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 they came out with Centipede. And yeah. Pac-Man, and then that just blew the bank off the roof off the bank, you know. Pac-Man, uh, Pac-Man was Pac-Man was Pac-Man. Amazing. You had to have skill, man, because the further levels you'd go up, and when you get to when you get the power yeah. up to go after the ghost, they didn't have long the flash blue, then back to normal, and they got faster, and you had to strategize how to get all the pellets. And get them before the ghost would get you. Centipede now, was fun too, man, because uh, you had to stop yeah. that damn thing before he'd get faster. Same thing with um, Space Invaders. Same concept. Yes, yeah, Space Invaders yeah. a big sell too. Yeah. Yeah. Then I remember I uh, they said, "Oh, you got to come down and check out the new uh, C. A. Robinson Company in Los Angeles uh, carried all the new games, and they would call all of us uh, that had." Uh, routes and and even the big boys at the uh, Aladdin's Castle, you know the huge uh, centers of the games and everything. Mm-hmm. They call us all and we'd come down and they would let us play and look and observe the new games that were fixing to be released. Right. And uh, before the, before they're released to the public, mm-hmm. and uh, the, you know the arcade owners. That's what I was trying to say. The arcade owners and then the independent contractors like me, uh, we were all down there for the debut. And I remember. They debuted Dragon's Lair. It's the first video disc uh, upright arcade video oh, game. Oh yeah, Dragon's and Lair. That, w- that was a killer game, man. And uh, yeah. I would take them. I would buy them and bring them home. And me and the friends would play them all night, you know, day uh, before I take them down the location. So if there's any bugs in them or anything, you know, we'd mess them up at home and fix it before it got on the location. Right, but. Uh, I didn't keep it. I only kept them at home for about a week and a half because you wanted to get them the newest games right down there on the location right when they came out because this is what the people kids wanted to play, you know. Right. But right. I had I had uh, I never did master Pac Man, but I did master pretty well Stargate Defender. That's a hard game to play too. You got to really work and have skill to to get far on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the original Defender uh, wasn't as complex as Stargate Defender. It was color. I think the original Defender might have been black and white, but right. Stargate Defender is an awesome game, and I mean, you're just beating the fire out of those things and those switches and buttons. And uh, I pretty well mastered that when I could get up in the multi millions of points on that. Then I bought a Zaxxon. You remember Zaxxon? Zaxxon. So you flew the, you flew a jet um, through like these walls and over these yeah. different barriers and stuff, and it yeah. had like a actual. You know uh, the thing, the the stock that you gripped and everything was identical to what's on a a, a PF a jet fighter. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And it had, had remember the fire that. buttons. And yeah, that was a cool game. I liked that. And, yeah, uh, but uh, my biggest money makers were what I said: the sit down uh, asteroids and um, centipede. Uh, centipede and there's the other black and white Galica. Galica, yeah. I you're talking about talking about the arcade machines. I remember back when Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat 2 came out. I think it was Mortal Kombat 2 that came out. One of the magazines yeah. that I subscribed to, they had a contest in there where if you send in so many you, you can send in so many your like entries and you can win a arcade machine of Mortal Kombat 2. I think it was Mortal Kombat 2. So I, I put my name in the hat, and I put in, I think I filled out like 100 entries with my name, and I mailed them off. I never did win a thing, though, but I was talking to someone, and also as I saw some like videos and stuff about having those arcade machines in your house, 
Those things suck the power out of your house, man. <laughs> they 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 take yeah. a lot of power. I didn't think about that because I was watching actually this thing on this uh about I was watching this documentary or something on like people winning contest and one of the things stories was this guy won an arcade machine. He plugged that thing up to his house. Ha- uh, uh the guy came over, programmed it everything, made sure he was like, well, it's like gave him the key. It's like you can charge your buddies twenty five cents, you know, and you can make money off them if you choose, or you can just not do it and have it where the quarter returns. But having that thing plugged up, their electric bill at the end of the week was like a thousand dollars. It was like holy yeah. crap. They suck energy, man. I mean, that a lot of power. And I used to have I used to have as many as three of them going at the same time in the living room of the house. So during that first week uh, that I was breaking them in and checking them, but uh, I failed to mention though one of the biggest money makers too was Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong, yeah, yeah. When I when my brother had the Atari when 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 we had the Atari, I think it was the twenty six hundred, or then later on it was like the seventy eight hundred Atari. That it had Donkey Kong on it, and Donkey Kong, man, that drove me crazy there because my brothers could go through it. I couldn't go through that damn thing. I got so mad. It takes a while. It takes a while to save the princess. Yeah. It, yeah. It take it. it mm-hmm. You can imagine how many quarters it took people to go through to get that far. Yeah, I remember Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Two, and they changed it up with Donkey Kong Three, which was a little bit different. They had it where Donkey Kong in the was in the middle on two vines, and he would slide down the vines. And your your job, you're this guy called Pete, I think his name was. He was exterminator, and you'd spray this thing up in the air, and you had all these bugs start coming, and you got to like kill the bugs, and you got to spray him, keep spraying him. They go up the vine. If he fall, if he comes down. If you're down, he'll fall on you, and then game over. They kind of yeah. changed it up there with Donkey Kong two and three, but the third one, third one got challenging, man. It it drove me crazy playing Donkey Kong three. I got obsessed with that. I was probably about eleven years old. I got obsessed with that. I was like, I'm gonna beat this damn game. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. And see the 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 people would be lined up like at the uh, the minute marks that I had uh, had uh, three games each at on two of them. Uh, I mean, there'd be a darn line all the way to the back of the store and around three or four aisles. I mean, mm-hmm. people were lined up to play. I mean, it was great. The I had nine games all together uh, on three different locations, uh, three per location. And uh, the first 12 days, I went down 12 days to see how it was doing. I think my take in quarters was something like over $10,000. Jeez, that's in ten in ten days. In ten days, ten thousand dollars. Ten ten days. Damn. But see, uh, but that's, see, I had I, the locations that I had. I bought out from a prior established independent guy that had been running these locations for a long time and built them up. And he always had the latest games, so they drew the biggest crowds. Mm-hmm. So uh, I bought out his territory, so to speak. And then what games that he had on them? Some of the games I didn't want because they were starting to be older, and just told him to haul them off and sell them. Right. And uh, but I never forget that. I couldn't believe it. I went home and told my girlfriend. I said, "You're not going to believe this." I said, "I'm not sure I can believe it. It's unbelievable." <laughs> and the money, uh, the money, I had to leave the lids off the top of the money catchers because it, the quarters are just piled so much that they would, you know, if you pick up the lid on the money box. Once it filled the box so fast, then you know it wouldn't. Uh, there wasn't anywhere for the money to go. You know, it'd back up and they couldn't play. So I'd take the lids off of that. I'd open it up and that box would be filled and it'd just be a mountain of quarters in the bottom of the game. You know, around the CPU board. Jeez, I I I was in a arcade one time and I seen a guy come in to empty the machine, and. I think I was next to one at one time, or I was. It was the one I was playing, and the, the guy comes over. He's like, "Gotta shut this off." He's like, "Shuts it off." And all of a sudden, you open up the back, and it sounds like a chain. Someone take a chain out. You know the sound of a chain hitting the ground, going you know, like you pulling a chain out, going. Mm-hmm. Shh. All of a mm-hmm. sudden, 
we looked, me and my friend were like, oh my God, he's pulling out all these quarters in this big bucket and just shh. And then yeah. the guy was cool enough. If I was on that machine he was playing and he came to empty or I was ne- next to it there or if I was on it, the guy that was emptying the machine, he'd, he'd say, here you go. He'd give me a couple extra quarters. He was nice to do that. He's like, oh, I always did that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that whenever I nice. brought in a new machine, I'd put maybe 50, 50 free plays on it. Of mm-hmm. course, and they'd be fighting and elbowing and wrestling <laughs> and slugging over who. Let me up there. Let me, let me, you know. But I'd give them like 53 games <laughs> just to draw attention, you know. And that, that was like advertising. And, man, that's all it took. And that, that stuff was a gold mine for a couple of years. And then when the Atari came out, it, that's when the, the beat down started. It, it didn't beat it completely down off the bat, but it started to make a little bit of a effect. But then within the next year to two year period of that, the home video games just destroyed the independent game provider. Right. The only people that the only people could make it after that were just the, the big arcade outfits and even a lot of them folded up. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it just went down from there because the home games just got better and better and better and better. But I remember uh, I bought one of the first um, uh, Ataris, and it, they, this woman w- would go to Japan and load up on them and bring them back with her from Japan and sell them from a motel room. And I think I paid $110 for mine. Wow. Uh, but, I, but I had one, you know, they weren't, the stores were sold out. Mm-hmm. You know, you couldn't even, you couldn't even find an Atari system in a store. They were sold out. Yeah, one of the one of the <laughs> one of the worst games that was released on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred was ET. <clears throat> it was one of the worst games because the the development and it was just rushed, and it became one of the worst commercial disasters for a game of a game for Atari. They ended up, it sold so bad over that holiday season that the copies that they didn't sell, they took out to the desert. And buried, and and buried, buried it in the desert. Yes. And the guy went out there and dug them all up, too. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear about that? He found, he found, he went yes, out there. Yes, I did. He dug them all up, man, all the copies of E.T. there. I actually had that game. I I liked it. I was just a kid, though. But going back, watching it and stuff, and understanding the concept uh, when I, you know, being old, mm-hmm. since I'm older now, I was like, yeah, this game sucked. <laughs> but as a kid, yeah, uh, like, oh, this is so great. But it took a while because I it was so conflicting and I couldn't understand how to do this. Some some of the games are pretty good though. Uh, I remember the Robotron for that was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robotron was very was exactly like the arcade version. Right, right. But it didn't have a lot of extra graphics and stuff, you know. Uh, it was just more kind of like Pac-Man, but a little different character, you know, thing. But, um, yeah, I remember, you know, I, I had to buy new games about every four months, four to four to six months max. Six months was pressing it because, you know, new games kept coming out like about every four months or so, and, and the kids go, Game man, when are you going to bring in the new so and so? You know, and so to keep that money coming, you had to uh, buy new, keep continually be buying new games. You know, every every four months or so. Exactly. And what I would what I would do the ones that still were classics like Pac Man and you know and uh, Centipede, I'd uh, Defender, I'd keep them, but some of the other ones, you know, like Zaxxon and those other ones, I would sell them. To other operators, uh, right. usually people are just getting in the business and whatever, getting going. And I would sell those and take the money and apply some more money to buy the new games. But you had to continually buy new new upright games, and they weren't cheap, man. Those things were like you know three thousand dollars a piece and stuff. Expensive, expensive. The, the, yeah, the video, especially especially like nowadays nowadays with like home consoles. Just buying buying games. There there's so many coming out at one time. My my mm-hmm. cousin one year, he I ended up getting a couple games. I'd like I'd get probably maybe a new game once a year or or two games to, uh, once a year. 
he was he's buying all these like three or four or five different games that's coming out and he's like you didn't get this game no why i was like i can't get it you didn't get this game no why because i i can't get it i got other priorities but arcade machines i think that pl- pl- establishes establishments like dave and busters and like for like kid games for like say like Chuck E. Cheese, they're they're keeping those things going because last year me and or not last year, the year before, it has been about a couple years now, me and me and my wife celebrated our wedding anniversary. It, it was in twenty nineteen. Yeah. It's September twenty nineteen. We celebrated our wedding anniversary. We went out to this, they built the Dave and Busters close by to us here. And we went to it. Instead of going all the way to Orlando, Dave and Buster's, we went to it. We I think we went to it a couple times there, but we had we had a great time. We had arcade machines in there, just like a lot of the arcade stuff I remember playing in the arcade growing up. But that's that that's those establishments are keeping what's going now is that right there is yeah you know stuff like I'm still there. I'm still here. I'm just getting getting some water. Okay. Yeah, it was like you're blacking out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the dark. <laughs> you're in the I'm, dark. I'm here. You, the invisible man, you can kind of see me weaving around there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the the video games were um now some of the video games uh I had them uh, altered, you know, cuz you could use the same monitor screen and the same box. So I took um Donkey Kong after it started kind of drop down, I painted the whole cabinet like blue and whatever, and put a, a different a CPU board in it, and it was a, a voila, it's a new game. <laughs> That's amazing. I I like mm-hmm. that. I definitely like that. I I definitely do. That's I mean, were, uh, you had to do what were, you had to do. The guy the the guy that, that worked on the CPU boards and stuff. Um, he had a direct contact with uh, Korea or somewhere where they were bootlegging. You know, they had bootleg uh, Donkey Kongs, and they called it Crazy Kong, but it was the same game. It was the same characters, same movement, same everything, but it was a lot cheaper than going down there and paying $3,500 or 4000 for a brand-new game, you know. But right. I got to where I, I, got to where I modified a, a few of the... Uh, cabinets and stuff like that. Take them outside and uh, paint them and uh, just uh, go up and buy a, a new CPU board or whatever game it was and put in there and just repurpose it. You know, it was cheaper than going out and buying the whole thing because the monitor and everything and all of them is the same. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. since, 20, since 2020, came and gone i know that you weren't able to go out much and travel like you did in 2019 to conventions and stuff though but you did you did appear on a lot of different different shows and stuff and everything but with 2021 i mean we're already this month's almost over here and what what do you got in store for the rest of 2021? What's what is going on? Uh, if you, I know you mentioned about not willing to travel until until like the middle of the year when when things get get you know some when everything starts you know getting down there and stuff. But when you're able to travel again and go out what what do you what do you have in mind or what what do you have your eye on to do for the uh, the second half of 2021 when that comes around well i've been asked to appear at uh nashcon uh, in nashville uh it's going to be in november i think they may have something before that but they they do november too so i told them i would you know pin me in for that uh, pending that the that all these viruses don't uh, pin us down worse um, but uh, that's an event and then my friend Chad Flat has just opened a new store outside of Nashville called uh, uh, City uh, I can't remember the exact name of it let me think a minute uh, Nashville City Toys and Collectibles or something like that and um, 
he's wanting me to come down. He's wanting to try to rig something up uh, with Jimmy Hart and me both. So we'll see if that can work out. But uh, one way or the other, he wants me to come down later in the year and do a meet and greet in his new store that he just uh, leased a, a big building, you know, for all his collectibles and stuff. And then I've been working uh, quite a bit on some a lot of new music. And then also, of course, my main thing I'm working on is this uh, major motion picture script that I've got. And um, unfortunately, right when it was completed and ready to go, that's when the virus hit and everybody's scared to go anywhere and do anything. So uh, I do have a couple appointments booked uh, on that to talk to a couple of different uh, motion picture companies and also uh, two law firms to represent me and us. Uh, Evan Ginsberg's in with me on it, uh, our film. Uh, DJ 21, Defenders of Justice, 21st Century is the title. And uh, so we're looking to uh, make some follow-up appointments, you know, on that. And I've sent some letters of introduction to uh, Loeb and Loeb in New York City, which handles all the major publishing and entertainment contracts for a lot of big movie stars and BTS and music groups and stuff. And... Um, you know, uh, making myself known to them. So uh, once somebody, uh, when they jump on what we've got, you know, I've got to need to have some really good representation. So I'm right. just sending out some letters of introduction. I've done that. Um, but Evan Ginsberg and I intend to travel and uh, make a, a few pitches uh, for our film and uh, see what we come up with with that. So that's my main goal for 2021 is to uh, try to make a deal uh, you know, on my uh, screenplay and everything. That's my main goal. And then, you know, I have other uh, things, that, uh, events as well they're wanting me to do. Uh, a lot of things up in the air that I think will wind up happening. But really, I, I had to cancel uh, five different events because of the virus. You know, I just couldn't risk traveling and didn't want to. You know, right. though I do know uh, some people, uh, for instance, Andrew Anderson, the uh, wrestler, independent wrestler, uh, it's real popular. Uh, Andrew, he's not stopped at all. He's been flying and going to Texas and working with that SWE bunch down there and working up in New Jersey and New York and around. And it hadn't it hadn't curtailed him uh, any. But and somehow he's managed not to come down with the virus. But you know, I, I just uh, but he also doesn't take medicine that lowers your resistance like I do to where you could catch the virus quicker. Right. So. So really, the virus has curtailed everybody and everything. It right when we were getting ready to jump right out of the box of this uh, film project and everything, of course the virus hit. And yeah. Whatever, but um, but that's pretty much my plans uh, right at this moment. I don't really plan on too many things. I just kind of follow my nose with where it says I should go. And uh, but that's my main goals this year is uh, Evan and I to uh, make some pitches on the screenplay and. Um, I've got some uh, new music that I'm going to put on my uh, YouTube channel and uh, beef that up some. I actually had a couple other subscribers. I only have one thing or two things on there to look at, but I'm going to load it up with some of the wrestling stuff and different things. You know, give people at least something more than one or two things to look at. Right. And uh, and I may start doing a live blog on there once a week just come on and go hi everybody it's me just want to let you know i'm still alive and uh hope everybody's feeling good blah 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 and just do a, a quick shout out you know maybe once a week but i'm gonna start being more active on that youtube channel i think mm -hmm. i need to do more with it but i have a lot of um due to my interest in bts and a lot of the k-pop stars i've gained a whole lot of new friends that are from over there from Korea and the Philippines and China wow. and, uh, you know, really interesting uh, to talk and look at people of other cultures, you know. That's been a lot of fun. That's so, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's that's basically it. Uh, just I'm supposed to be retired, but I, re I refuse to, to just sit around and do nothing. Uh you know, uh, I want to continue to create something. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, that's kind of what it is. And then I intend to come down to Florida. Uh, uh, CFWE uh, is interested in having me do a meet and greet and some stuff, maybe around the ring and whatever, and do a little promotional thing. And then there's a couple other promotions down there, too, that are interested in me 
uh, doing some stuff. And, uh, of course, Jimmy Hart and I, we, we've always got something we're cooking up on the back burner. So, you know, <laughs> there's things going on a little bit here and there and whatever. And um, I'm just right now just trying to stay alive, you know. Right. That's my main goal t- today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My Mine, too. I mean, I'm right there with you. Just get through the day, stay alive, and uh, you know, you know, plan for plan for yeah. tomorrow. That's that's take all care you of your family. Uh, you know, your family's the uh, biggest asset you a person has, and um, that's the most important thing is to take care of your family. And uh, it sounds like, fortunately, for uh, you and Amanda and a lot of people that I know, uh, they've managed to continue uh, having a job and working through this mess. Yeah. And yeah. and there's so many people that you and I both know that once the mess hit, that was the end of their job. They got nothing. Exactly, exactly. I counted up the days last year. I was furloughed for 74 days. 74 yeah, that days. That was plenty. Plenty That's, enough, wasn't it? Yeah, that that was enough because towards that towards the end of it, I was starting to get used to it. I'm like, well, I guess this is life. <laughs> and then all yeah. of a sudden I get a yeah. call out of the blue come back to work next week i'm like damn no staying up yeah. till 3 a.m anymore lasted. yeah yeah i'd stay up till 3 a.m then wake up wake up late you know run yeah. around do some stuff i mean i was really pushing my podcast i was really pushing it and i tell you i mean i took time off uh, in october 2020 a lot of stuff just came to a head it just I had to take some time off, man. I burnt the candle down on both ends, and I was like, I need a break. So I stepped away for a bit, and I recharged my batteries, and I'm back. You know, I mean, this is the fourth recorded podcast I have in the bag ready to be put out this uh, for for next month here. But at this time now, it will be that month that this is out <laughs> because – I want to have content ready to go where I'm not scrambling each week. I know some of my buddies, they're, I'm seeing on, I'd see on Facebook, looking for someone to do a podcast with. Look, It's like plan ahead, plan ahead, always plan ahead. And I, I, just, I don't want to be that person where I, at the last minute, it's happened twice. It happened twice, I think, last year where... I had at the last minute had to call someone like at the last minute. Hey, can you come on? Yeah, I'm free. I ain't doing nothing. That's great. But other than that, I want to make sure I have content ready to go and just put out whenever and not worry about scrambling for that. And mm-hmm. that's pretty much the approach for 2021. But with me doing it as long as I have, there's been talk, and I've been talking with my <coughs> wife and. I've been pretty much been, you know, contemplating going back and forth. I want to see how things happen and how things go in the middle of this year and see what happens. And by the middle of this year, I'm going to make a decision on whether or not I'm going to continue doing this ride or not by the end of 2021. Because depending on how everything goes, by the end of 2021, 2022, more Everett Lee will be out or possibly not. Because there's a lot of other things that get get my attention that I may do. And, of course, one thing is running Podcast City Network and other projects. So I may be hanging up the mic at the end of 2021. I don't know. I'll just have to see. I'm going to play it by ear. But I'm going to enjoy this as much as I can for this year. You know, getting to talk with great people and great friends such as yourself and a lot of other people. But I'm just going to play it by ear. Take one day at a time, man, just like you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all we can do right now. I mean, if you try to sit here and say, plan something and put it in stone, it, right now is not a time to do that. you got to nope. be really flexible right now on everything. That's that's what I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be more mm-hmm. flexible now than I am the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, it was like I can line up all my ducks on the row and be like, 
boom, 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 boom. Now it's like you can't line up nothing because it all of a sudden life. It, remember those old commercials for life comes at you fast, where the lady's pulled up in the in the in the garage, and all of a sudden the door keeps slamming it real quick, and like life comes. That's how life feels for me. <laughs> I may get hit in the head with the garage door, and then you know tomorrow wake up thinking I'm uh, Napoleon Dynamite or something. I don't know. <laughs> Never know, never know. So, I'm just gonna take it one one day at a time. But, man, I always love talking to you off can, off the record and on the record. I love talking with you or conversations. If people's wanting to know how me and JJ McGuire's conversations are, it's just like this. <laughs> Off yeah, camera. it really is. Off yeah, we got camera. nothing scripted. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're old. We're like old school wrestling. Nothing scripted. No, no, nothing scripted. Nothing. You, you can't script this stuff, man. <laughs> no, no. We're just talking about life in general, and you know, uh, I refer one more time back to BTS. Uh, their their whole motif. You know, most American stars that make it. It's all about them. It's like be like me, uh, look like me, uh, be like me. But these guys, what they've done is they've created a uh, an idea in music and whatever they're entertaining, dancing and whatever, where it's it's all about you. Uh, you be you. Don't worry about us being somebody big. You think about more about yourself and make yourself somebody big. That's the difference, and I like that. And John Cena bragged on them too on John on uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon. He spent about 15 minutes talking about it. Plus, he gave a million dollars to uh, one of the charity causes uh, that they had given to. And uh, when uh, they saw that John Cena gave that money, the BTS fan base, what they call ARMY, they matched it. They matched a whole other million dollars. So wow. between BTS giving a million, John Cena giving a million, and the fan base giving a million, they got $3 million there just in just a couple of days. That's amazing. I I love that. That's I'm gonna have. They to... like John Cena. They they like wrestling too. But see, they came along after uh, pretty much a run like the Jimmy Hart and I have had. Uh, they came along right after all the 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 uh, uh, Hulkamania and all that stuff. But they know who all that is, of course. But they really really like John Cena. They're wild about John Cena. Those guys are BTS is. Yeah, why? I mean, why would you? Why would you not, man? He was yeah. he was the face of the company there for a long time, and I mean, he was one of the he was one of the biggest ones there. I mean, when when I talk about for WWE, when I talk about like faces of the company, I look at um, Bruno San Martino, Hulk Hogan, mm -hmm. Stone Cold Steve Austin, John Cena. Those are the mm -hmm. ones that come to my mind right there. Right there, that when I, yeah. when I think of like face of the companies for their error, and he yeah. was Cena was the face during the ruthless aggression error all the way up until when he uh, Hollywood started calling and he he got out of it, man. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, good actor. He's a good actor. Yeah, I next well this year now be able to see the uh, Fast and Furious Nine. He's the villain in it. So, Sounds yeah, good. yeah, I, I'm one of those people that still watches a, that movies franchise because I still love it, and I know a lot of people nowadays crap on it because of the direction and everything. I I still find it entertaining, and I'd love to see how they do this one different from everything else. So, <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I, I'll, I'm along with you. I'm right there in the same row of the theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this has been great. This has been great, man. Um, you're on Facebook. That's about the only thing you use there for social media. You're on Facebook. What um, I'm going to look into getting on. I'm going to look into getting on uh, Twitter. But uh, I'm gonna. My son tells me he says, Dad. Some of the music that you've got and what you do, you said you need to put it on TikTok because you'd blow up unbelievable on TikTok. You probably would. So I guess I'm a, I'm going to listen to what he said. So I've got a new song ready to go that I'm going to debut. I think on TikTok. Nice, 
Nice. If uh, my phone is still stuck in 2016, <laughs> I'm not up to date. <laughs> I'm si- yeah, this, the only thing this thing does is text and call. That's it. That's it. I don't yep. spend a lot of time on this. I'll tell you what happened one night. Um, I left work, and I left it at work, and I went came home. And I was in the car, and I was like, I meant to turn on the Bluetooth just in case wife calls. Where's my phone? Oh, man, I left it. I, I'm not getting it. I'm not going back. So I left it at work. I left it at work, and I I came home, and, uh, you know, I told, told my wife. I told Amanda. She's like, where's your phone? I was like, I left it at work. What? What? You left? I was like, ah, don't worry about it. So thank God for computers. So I jumped on, I jumped on and messaged a couple people and said, hey, don't call me. I'm not going to answer my phone. I left it at work. And they're like, really? It's like, yeah. Next morning, found it right there, and I picked it up. And people I work with are like, I was like, oh. I was like, there's my phone. They're like, what would you do? I was like, I left it here all night. You left your phone here all night. And they freaked out. They're like, they're like, they're like you left your phone. And I just like, chill out. I was like, this thing, this thing does not control my life. I control my life. I am the master of right. my reality. I choose and I could I'm in control, not this technology. I mean it's convenient, it's nice, but I don't let let it control my life. So <laughs> that's just that's how right. I that's how I feel about it, you know? It's like it's like, well, how how do I get a hold of you? Here's my phone number, call me. Here and you can also use that to text me. So that, that that that's just mm-hmm. you know I mean I'll get on I look at this thing probably maybe once or twice a day when um, mm-hmm. someone calls or texts me oh yeah I just I ran out of memory too so I had to turn off all the notifications I have to look at the phone to see who texts me <laughs> yeah yeah that that's how old it is but eventually I'll here sometime later this year I'll get I'll up upgrade to a new phone <laughs> well my kids came up the other day and they they both had new iphone minis you know the mini mm-hmm. iphone m-i-m-i-n-i M-I-N-I. yeah and uh they, they seem to like it pretty good but see they do all their heavy rooting on uh tablets and and uh laptops right you know so they don't you know a phone to them mainly is just uh I don't even think Marshall only texts to just a few friends of his. He doesn't. Of course, the younger kids like that, they don't care about Facebook. They think that's just stuff for people, older people or something, you know. <laughs> right. But right. Uh, uh, but any rate, but I'm going to take his advice in this next video I do. I'm going to just see what happens. I'm going to release it on TikTok. Plus, I notice that TikTok's visual quality is stellar. Yeah. Uh, still, some of Facebook still beats down the algorithm to where sometimes you watch it. Yeah, it's up there at 1080p. Then you watch it again, and it, it's dithered down to 260 or something. You know, uh, mm-hmm. it's not constant. So, uh, but I enjoy uh, Facebook. Is something more for middle aged and older people, I believe. Uh, but it's nice that people in our uh, age groups and whatever. Uh, I have something like that to reminisce with, and it sure beats just going back and looking at it and at the old high school annual every time, you know. Exactly. Though that's though that's what you're kind of doing, but it's a little more exciting than that. Uh, but I think all the the platforms are good for what they do, and it's just up to people to to utilize them and and uh, and police themselves. Uh, it's so easy to get on there and hate on somebody or something and scream and. Uh, it takes a lot more skill to be more eloquent and maybe not say anything sometimes. And people just need to educate themselves more about. Like I have one particular friend. He's always continually got these political gimmicks on there. Things going on. He's always whining about the the politics. You know, he happened to be a big uh, Trump uh, follower and lover and and whatever. And and uh, I'm not talking against Trump, and I'm not talking good for Trump. I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote in this last election because I didn't like uh, e- uh, either person. I didn't care for Hillary. I didn't care for him. So uh, maybe I uh, hope I didn't let the country down, but 
I didn't vote this time because I didn't like either one of those people personally. But that's just my personal opinion. That doesn't mean those people couldn't do good or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Right. And uh, so uh, I'm going to go with whatever they're given. Uh, but what I'm getting at is this one friend of mine, All he, he just keeps ranting and ranting and, on Trump's cause and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, some of it was valid, but most of it's just overreaction and I just got tired of seeing that all the time. So, you know, um, people need to, um, I think people do better to discuss those heavy issues like that privately rather than just getting on a public forum and screaming big and loud and trying to scare people and upset people. And, you know, uh, it's up to us. It's Joe Biden's not going to save us. Uh, no president before us has ever saved us. We're going to have to save ourselves. Uh, we're going to have to be more prudent in the way that we treat other people and the way that we perceive other people. And we need to start thinking about what we say before we say it. And right. we just need to pol we need to police ourselves. I, I know people like you and me, we don't get on there and scream on politics and stuff uh, per se. No. But, uh, boy, boy, there's plenty of them that did. You know, and I saw a lot of, a lot of families broken up over this last uh, political thing and saw people or best friends their whole lives wind up hating each other because of different opinions on the presidential candidates and I've just seen so much ill will and and pain and suffering that could have been avoided if people would have uh, just res res restrained themselves a little bit maybe you know mm -hmm. so it's just up to us how we use these tools and uh, don't get me wrong social media I think and all that uh, uh, once they figure out how to make it really fair to everybody, uh, it'll be the greatest thing in the world. But it isn't right now. It favors certain political factions. It favors certain opinions and ideas. Uh, even though they claim, no, no, we don't do that. Yeah, you do it. And, um, you know, they just, uh, they, they, uh, uh, people need to learn how to do the right thing. Uh, they asked, uh, Darren Paltrowitz asked me on, interview that he did uh, that I did with him for the hype uh, magazine and digital magazine and everything and you know I told him I said that uh, you know people just they, they love to get on social media and create uh, tension not mm -hmm. attention but tension yeah. and I said that's a big mistake if people would just save uh, that for something else and regulate their self and do the right thing. He asked me, he said, what message would you have to give to young people? And he had interviewed uh, BTS a year ago, and uh, for instance, and right when they were starting to really climb up to big fame. And um, I said, my best message to young people or any people would be always do the right thing. And the way you do that is think about what you, you're going to do before you do it. Exactly. I can agree with you right there. <laughs> think before think before you say, think before you do. Think about it. Because I, I've yeah. gotten to a point where there's been a few times in, in my life where I look at something and I just, it makes me want to go ballistic and rage. But then I think about the outcome and the direction yeah. and the, and yeah. the reaction, the cause and effect for what's going to happen afterwards, the fallout. That's right. And then I well, said to myself, you, you know, you're, it's not worth you're, it. See, you're older now. You're not a kid anymore. And for sure, I'm, I'm kid-like and you're kid-like also, but mm -hmm. we are not kids anymore, see. Right. But, we but we've been taught uh, in school and everything that as you get older, you're supposed to act a certain way and be like a certain thing. But but really, the the sibilance of youth is in a person until the day you die. As long as you have your health, you know, you can promote that sibilance of youth your whole life, no matter how old you get. So I would also tell young people not to fear getting old or older, because uh, age and wisdom have their graces. And yes. I say that by living it. You know, I, I was a kid once, uh, I, like you and everybody else, but... Uh, now you're a person that's entering uh, mid -life, middle age, you know, 40s or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, pa I'm past that. But the point I'm making is that the longer you live and the more you look and listen and take it in and think, uh, the wiser you get. 
you can't be wise young. Nobody young is really wise. It takes age to gain wisdom. And But that doesn't mean you have to be an old fogey and give up on life and just sit in a chair and wait to go. Right. Um, you know, it's it's uh, we're going to always, guys like us are going to always be young at heart no matter how old we are. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the main. That's the main thing. Is just to stay, just to try to stay. Uh, keep keep your youth the best that you can because you know it's only you're only young once in your life. You know, and once you get to middle age, you start kind of thinking about things about how it was when you were a kid, and and you think about how it is being an adult and being a parent and all that right. stuff and having responsibility and but but that doesn't mean that you have to give up on. Uh, having youthful ideas and and still promoting people younger than we are, you know. Uh, exactly. I mean, here I am at the age that I'm at, but yet I can still dance, and I like BTS, and I like uh, a lot of the artists that the young younger people in their 20s like, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it, the whole thing is just how you play the game. You know, right. you can either play it the hard way or you can play it the easy way, but the best way to play the game is the correct and right way, no matter what age you're at. Right. Play, play it smart. Be smart about it. Play, play, play it smart. smart. That's my advice to everybody at any age bracket and any race, color, creed, or creed old. Uh, you know, just think about what you say and what you do and how it affects other people, and you're going to get a lot further, you know, and be able to take criticism. Don't be a person that wants to fight somebody and knock their teeth out because they might give you a suggestion that could help you. Exactly, exactly. I think we'll uh we'll end it end it right there or any anything last any sure. last words. <laughs> the end of the beginning. The end of the this beginning. This is the beginning. Yeah, the beginning. <laughs> Not the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning. <laughs> well, as always the true master of wrestling ring music, <laughs> Hurricane J.J. McGuire, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you yeah. so much for coming back on. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, uh, we live up here in the south. Me and Hillbilly Jim, he called me the other night and talked for two hours and a half and played me a lot of his music on his flat top guitar and sang to me. I mean, if I was a girl, I'd have to marry him. But <laughs> anyway, we, we live in the south. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome, Dan. Uh, Everett, Everett D. Lee, I always want to call you that middle name, but Everett, <laughs> thank you. Great friend, great guy. Knows as much about wrestling as anybody at WWE. I don't care who it is. Only person smarter than, than you is Vince McMahon. But other than that, I think you're right up there in the categories with the Jimmy Hearts and the Hogans and you know wrestling is good as anybody, brother, and I'll stand behind that forever. I <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hurricane J.J. McGuire, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So y'all be good now, and we'll be looking for you up here. We love you all. We live in the South where the life is real. As always, thank you, Hurricane J.J. McGuire for coming back on the program. It's always a blast talking with you and just talking about a number of topics and subjects and just anything that comes to mind. Thank you. Thank you, Hurricane J.J. McGuire. And be sure to follow Everett Lee on social media, Facebook, The Everett Lee Show, Twitter, at The Everett Laura Scorley, Instagram, at Everett Lee's show and be sure to follow and like and leave a rating and comment on the platforms for the audio portion of this podcast Podbeam, iHeartRadio Stitcher Radio Apple Podcast iTunes and Amazon Music and that wraps it up for this episode of the Everett Lee show I'm signing off we'll see you again next time for another episode of the Everett Lee show We'll